University and a college lecturer at City College of Calamba, province of Laguna, Philippines, and I will be your virtual host and moderator. Before we start, please follow this conference etiquette. With this, everyone will enjoy the whole program. To formally begin the program, we will be having an opening prayer to be followed by the singing of the India, Thailand, and Philippine national anthems. ever-loving Father, the core of every reason, the source of truth. You who made the earth and the heavens are the ultimate goal of every knowledge seekers, the infinite wisdom, the cause of all that is good. We are truly grateful for this opportunity to gather together as a community despite the challenges we face each day. Yet you remained and gave us strength to carry on the responsibilities of bearing intelligence and using them for better purposes. We now humbly ask you to join us in our endeavor to explore the wonders of life in the world for knowledge's sake, that in whatever we learn today, we become more grounded to you, who is truth, who is love. We pray that you bless our speakers, the fount of your infinite knowledge, that they can share something worthwhile despite the limited time we have. They can channel all they know and share to us the beauty and truth of living as your child. We pray that you guide our participants, the seekers of your boundless knowledge, that they may continue to persevere in the search and be deemed worthy to share what they learn from today's session. Sanctify us, O Lord, not because we are worthy of it, but because we believe in your love and mercy, that at the end of the day, we can take home something that's amazing and meaningful. This we ask and pray through Christ our Lord.
ธงชาติและเพลงชาติไทยเป็นสัญ,ญลักษณ์ของความเป็นไทยเราจงร่วมใจยืนตรงเคารพธงชาติด้วยความภาคภูมิใจในเอกราชและความเสียสละของบรรพบุรุษไทยInjury rehabilitation is a safe, therapeutic approach that helps athletes effectively treat pain and achieve optimal performance. With five key points: first, targeted targeted exercises to help you return to pre-injury function. Second, personalized exercise prescription. To improve mobility restrictions. Third, reduce susceptibility to further sport-related injuries. Fourth is the preparation to avoid recurring injury episodes, and fifth, achieving peak athletic performance. Let us now move on to the inaugural session. Today we are very fortunate. To have our distinguished dignitaries, guests, and resource person. At this juncture, let us hear from our dynamic and workaholic president of the International Association of Physical Education and Sports Incorporated, Associate Professor Dr. Jewelson M. Santos, sir. Good morning and afternoon to all the dignitaries, guests, resource speakers, and participants who are virtually present on today's conference. I am very delighted and grateful to the following personalities that made this event possible: to Dr. Piyush Jain, National Secretary, Physical Education Foundation of India, Associate Professor Dr. Kishore Mukhopadhyay, Chief Advisor, International Association of Physical Education and Sports, Professor Dr. Johnson, Dean. 
Sri Balaji Medical College, and Hospitals, Professor Darwin Offren, Director, Sports, and Development Office, Laguna State Polytechnic University System, Professor Dr. Atindra Nath Day, Director School of Education, Nataji Subhas Open University, and Dr. Morty, Director of Sports Medicine and Yoga, Sri Balaji Medical College and Hospital. To our distinguished resource speaker who will be properly introduced later. To Mr. Mark Anthony Dalapi, Dr. T.J. Panganiban, and Professor Faisal Fayaz, thank you so much most especially to your virtual host Mr. Jayasan Bursha, thank you. As all of us enjoy and love sports, there are circumstances that injury may occur, this needs a form of rehabilitation measures. Rehabilitation is a way to regain your flexibility, strength, power, and endurance after a sports injury. As critical as rehabilitation is after an injury, it is often overlooked. This could cost a person the full recovery they need to get back to their sport and prevent further injury. Hoping that on this conference, you will learn a lot. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you so much, Doc Jewel, for an inspiring introductory address. Another notable personality, a man with a great vision and very accommodating, the National Secretary of Physical Education Foundation of India to give his introductory address. May I call on Dr. Pius Jane, sir. Sir, he's not in the meeting room. Okay. So I am conveying my heartfelt congratulations to the organizing committee and working committee for the event. It's a grand success this afternoon. So moving on, let us now give the floor to the Dean, okay, so may I call on first the Chief Advisor of the IAPS, Associate Professor of Union Christian Training College and Member International Advisory Board, International Association of Physical Education and Sports Incorporated, for the welcome address, a very reliable and dependable associate professor, Dr. Kishore Mukupadhey, sir. Hello. May yes, I order sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I express my sincere thanks and gratitude to Professor Jewelson M. Santos, President International Association of Physical Education and Sports Incorporated for giving me the opportunity to deliver over here as a welcome speaker. So today, Dr. Pius Jain, National Secretary, Physical Education Foundation of India is not virtually present over here due to his busy schedule. I welcome today's guest, Professor, Johnson, Dean, Balaji Medical College and Hospital, Chennai, India. Then Professor Darwin Orfrin, Director, Laguna State Polytechnic University. Professor A. N. De, Director of School Education, Netaji Shuvas Open University. And today's keynote speaker, Professor A. M. Murthy, former Vice Chancellor, and as well as Director of Balaji Medical College and Hospital, Chennai. And today's moderator and coordinator, Mr. Bhatsika and Dr. Fayo. Today we have five resource speakers to deliver their speak over this platform. I welcome Mrs. Sirin Rai, Dr. Amraj Baharlui from Iran, Dr. Bharat Kumar B from India, Dr. Mrs. Nita Kavulari, India, and Dr. Kiran Kulkarni from India. And last, in the concluding session, 
we will have Professor Faisal Fayaz, my dear friend from Pakistan, then Dr. TJ Panganivan, Mrs. Pallon. Today, the concept of the international conference is sports injury rehabilitation. So injury is a part of life of a sportsman. Throughout his sporting career, every athlete has to face the consequence of the injury. Now, it is the duties of the sports medicine specialist to manage the injury and promote a proper rehabilitation program so that the athlete can return to his normal field within a shortest period of time for prevention and treatment of athletic injury. It can be divided into two parts. First one is the assessment part, and second one is the treatment part. For assessment part, three aspects are there. First principle is A, B, C, airways, breathing, and circulation. Sex, second principle is total phase, talk, observation, touch, active, passive, and skill. These are the principles. And after getting some sort of knowledge and degree of severity of the injury in the rehabilitation phase, the treatment should be followed properly with the help of exercise therapy. In these cases, the price principles and police method is generally adopted as well as cardiopulmonary dissociation is also imparted depending upon the condition of an athlete. And we, everybody has to avoid the no harm principle. That means no, no heat, no alcohol, no running, no massage. So these are all the basic aspects of the uh, sports injury rehabilitation. We have a renowned and learned resource speakers in this area. We will learn a lot from their uh, talk and last of all, I welcome all the participants who are participating from different parts of the uh, uh, world in this global conference. And I hope this conference a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much to our chief advisor of IAPS, Dr. Associate Professor Dr. Kishor Mukhopadhyay. Thank you, sir. And now, to give us a message, the Director of School of Education in Nataji Subhas Open University, let's welcome to give his message. Professor Dr. Atindran Nath Day. Sir, good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning, India. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us, for me also, to participate in the International Conference on Sports Injury and Rehabilitation. Effective, safe, and therapeutic treatment approaches in achieving optional performance of athletes. It's a very nice topic we have selected. So at the beginning, I it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Sutton, the president of ISP, IAPS, Dr. Pijus Jain, National Secretary of PFI, Dr. Johnson of Biology Medical College, Mr. Johnson, the moderator, Dr. Joseph Raj, uh, Ralph, the convener, Professor Darwin, director, our learned keynote speaker, my friend, Dr. A. Murthy from India, Dr. TJ, Professor Faisal, Dr. Kishore Mukhopadhyay, who took the trouble to introduce us and who is taking keen interest in India. And in the resource person, very uh, renowned resource persons, Mr. Rai from Sai, India, Dr. Hamis from Iran, Dr. Bharat Kumar from Sai, India, Nita Kavleri from Sai, India, Dr. Kiran Kulkarni from Sai, India, all the guests and participants and learned friends, those who are watching in, the, in this visual platform. At the beginning, I congratulate the team of 
IASPE and PFI for selecting a relevant topic for promotion of sports on the eve of Tokyo Olympics. Sports is an, as we know, sports is an integral part of society and sports science and sports medicine is the most challenging science in 21st century. India has a successful story in the field of sports, but we are still lacking behind in the international arena, which needs to be rectified, to be developed. And as a part of national policy, so I'm sure the government of India, our honorable prime minister, Modi ji is given due respect to the sports persons and due uh, interest by the government of India in the for promotion of sports. And with this help, I'm sure with this national policy, I'm sure the sports person in India will have the courage to face at the international arena. Today's topic, sports injury and rehabilitation is one of the most important aspects to be discussed and deliberated. The, we can hear the resource persons, very nicely selected the resource persons and different areas. I am sure the expert panelists will highlight the various areas which will give us a new dimension. Once again, I express my sincere thanks to honorable keynote speaker, Dr. A. Muti will be waiting for his nice speech. And I'm sure with his vast, vast experience in the field of sports medicine and yoga and physical education, he'll be able to highlight the entire details. So I express my sincere thanks to the entire organizer, the organizing committee, the host, the co-host, and I express my gratitude for inviting me and uh, thanks to Kishore Mukhopadhyay. And I wish at last, I pray and wish the workshop a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Atindra Nath Day, the Director of the School of Education, Netaji Subhas Open University, for your notable and inspiring message in our International Conference on Sports Injury Rehabilitation. So at this juncture, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So at this juncture, let us hear from the Director of Sports Medicine and Yoga from Siri Bataji Medical College and Hospital to give his keynote address. Let's all welcome Dr. A.M. Murthy, sir. Dr. Murthy, please, please unmute, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yes, yes sir. Yes. You're audible. Are you hearing it? Yes, Hello? sir. Yes. yes, sir. No, yes. So, uh, I must thank all of you, especially my friends. Dr. A and B, who made me to come and talk something about this, especially on sports medicine. My dear friends, expert that Kishore, Dr. Kishore has taken initiative a lot for the sports development of young chap who is coming up. All participants and resource person, I must only to few advice. Through my experience, I will tell you. The sports we wanted to develop from the younger to top, up to 35. So we have to set even, I can say, boom itself. 
mother spoon itself we have to give some training especially we must ask the mother to walk slowly and talk about and speak about and this is a psychological thing she has to see the olympian and the picture and all the thing this is the first one second one then the school we also today that day nicely pointed out our government of india policy is to introduce compulsory sports education and physical education in the school that should come not only here now over the world the people you see those who are introducing physical education is a compulsory subject and definitely you can see the sports person will come out then after school they have to various card competition has to be organized in the after competition they have where the injury happens how to prevent we have to see the before competition during competition after a competition we have got lot of things sports physiotherapist we we are not having the that of people in the medicine sports medicine and all over the world in the sports physiotherapy but still the modernized training has to be developed by you are young people you know all the things i want you all of you to to take caution to capture up exercise therapy capture that you are giving five exercise for this particular ankle injury for rehabilitate particular uh, five exercise or six capsule exercise will be for the back pain most of the people are suffering now five exercise for the endurance this five exercise for the development of uh, flexibility five cap one capsule will make the development of basic fitness development of high fitness yeah, the now individualized yes the international president pointed out he told the individualized things have to be taught it is not then one athlete and another other athlete different especially a will be a different b will be different we have to train individually what we are doing it in the schools and colleges and university mass training mass things we are giving it is necessary basically but when it comes in the specialized one you must give specialized things specialized exercise and all the things rehabilitation is another part which you have to rehabilitate a sportsman immediately has to come and join that we have to develop my dear friends i don't want to take much of your time indian government has to think over it to make a compulsory policy the school compulsory physical education university education colleges physical education sports should be compulsory i will suggest even examination subjects will be the better the people will enter into it unless otherwise in the all the people when we make it compulsory then the people are not entering it now today you see the people who are going to the olympic when you see their history of them thing they themselves trained some of the school coaches some of the military person some of the police person they themselves so where is the university our india has to produce more olympian from the university in college where is that our university so we must make them in the i request once again the all resource person all of you participants think about it we must think a capsule of exercise to the 20 at least 2024 olympics we must have the not that the hundreds of hundreds of people will participate in the olympic standard with this thing i wish you all of you i must thank once again my friend professor ayan day and also dr kishore international president secretary and organizers especially dr kishore and bhu koyal everybody participant once again god will bless you with this thing thank you so much for you are giving me this opportunity to talk to you thank you thank you thank you namaskar jai hind okay thank you so much to our keynote speaker address give his keynote address Dr. A. M. Murthy, for a very enlightening message, you mentioned about modernized training related to sports therapy and rehabilitation, and the compulsory of physical education in sports in schools. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
So at this juncture, let's move on now to the technical session for us to hear from the different resource speakers to present to you our first speaker, the sports physiotherapist, NCOE Department of Sports Science, Sports Authority of India on her topic, sports injury management. Let's all give a virtual round of applause to Ms. Shirin Rai. Madam, please. Hello, am I audible? Yes, madam, you're audible. Thank you. A very good morning to respected president of International Association of Physical Education and Sports, uh, Dr. Joelson M. Santos, uh, National Secretary of Physical Education Foundation of India, Dr. Piyush Jain, uh, and to all the guests and all the viewers of this conference. Before starting my presentation, I would like to thank uh, the IAPES and SPEF of India for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak and share my knowledge in this platform. So I'm going to start my presentation now. So the topic of my presentation is sports injury management. What are sports injuries? Sports injuries are injuries that occur when engaging in any kind of sports or exercise. They result from acute trauma or repetitive stress associated with athletic activities. The injuries can be minor or severe until it's fatal. It can be even either open, closed, or even internal bleeding. Injury is part and parcel of a game with a prevalence rate of 90% in every sports player in their career or sporting activity. Sports soccer carries the highest risk of sports injuries because more people participate in this sport. So the type of sports injuries. There are many ways to classify sports injuries based on the time taken for the tissues to heal, the tissue type affected, the severity of the injury, and which injury the individual presents with. So according to Bruckner and Khan, they have classified sports injuries into various uh, the classifications. So firstly, we see, uh, we get to look at bone. In acute in, uh, bone injuries, we get to see fracture or periosteal contusion. For overuse bone injuries, we can see stress factors, bone strain, stress reaction, osteitis, periostitis, apophysitis. In case of articular cartilage, uh, if they, are, uh, they have undergone acute injury, then we get to see osteochondral chondral fractures or minor osteochondral injuries. In case of overuse articular cartilage injury, we get to see chondropathy, which can be uh, softening of the cartilage, fibrillation, fissuring, or chondromalacia. For joints, acute joint injury, we can see dislocation or subluxation, and overuse injuries, we can see synovitis or osteoarthritis. For ligament acute injury, there are various grades of ligament injury, and we call them sprain ligament sprain, the grades will be from one to three according to the level of injury uh, perceived in the ligament. And overuse ligament injury will be shown as inflammation. The acute muscle injury will be again graded in from one to three and the muscle injury will be called strain or contusion, cramp or acute compartmental syndrome. In case of overuse muscle injuries, we can see chronic compartmental syndrome, delayed onset muscle soreness, focal tissue thickening, or fibrosis. For tendon acute injuries, we can see tendon tear, which can be complete or partial. Tendon uh, overuse injuries can be manifested as tendinopathy, which includes peritonitis, 
tenosynovitis, tendinosis, or, and tendinitis. In case of bursa acute injuries, we can see traumatic bursitis, and uh, if the bursa goes for overuse, then it will be termed as bursitis. For the nerve acute injuries, there'll be neuropraxia and overuse injuries for the nerve will, can be shown as entrapment, minor nerve injury or irritation or adverse neural tension. In skin, acute injuries uh, in skin, we can see a laceration, abrasion or puncture wound and overuse injuries of skin we can, can be shown as a blister or callus formation. So the causes of sports injuries. There are many intrinsic and extrinsic factors that causes overuse injuries, according to Bruckner and Khan. The intrinsic factor, which is like within the individual, so an in in intrinsic factor relates to the individual's inherent internal anatomical and pathological makeup. It is uh, present within the individual. The factors would be anatomical factors like size, gender, biomechanical deformity, malalignment, uh, deviation from po uh, normal posture, etc. The physiological factors we can uh, see lack of flexibility, muscle imbalance, muscle weakness, fatigue, etc. For age factors, uh, ch uh, child, adolescent, adult, master. So different uh, ages, they'll have different kinds of injuries. Causes of sports injuries. The extrinsic factors. Now, extrinsic factor will be uh, the outside factors outside the individual's body. Uh, that, those will be training related factors. What kind of training the uh, sports person goes, undergoes like in, increased volume, frequency, intensity of training. If there's any sudden change in the type of training, inadequate recovery. If the recovery is not adequate, they can get injured. The players can get injured. Equipment selection factors like the type of equipment the player is uh, wearing, damaged, inappropriate, uh, worn out shoes, playing surface uneven versus even, soft versus hard. So the uh, playing surface also uh, gives an uh, input in your sports injuries. The environmental factors like hot, cold and humid, the factors can uh, precipitate to sports injuries psychological factors and inadequate nutrition. So the common injuries we get to see in football or soccer. Football or soccer is one of the most common game played over the world and most injuries occur in it. Uh, most of the injuries we get to see in uh, football are your knee injuries like ACL tear, PCL tear, meniscal injuries, shoulder injuries, like rotator cuff injuries or shoulder dislocation, anterior posterior dislocation, head collision injuries, heart failure. Uh, recently, a player from Denmark went unconscious midfield due to heart failure during the European Championship between the match was played between Denmark and Finland. So the player's name is Christian Eriksen. He was from Denmark. So we get to see a lot of heart failure cases in football. Ankle sprain is also common. The common uh, injuries we get to see in cricket are rotator cuff injuries in case of bowlers, thrower's elbow again in case of bowlers, medial meniscus injuries while running, impact injuries to hand and fingers. This can occur while fielding, lateral epicondylitis, intercostal strain, low back pain, again in speed bowlers and contusions. So the common injuries we get to see in swimming will be, uh, swimming is mostly we, uh, the player will be using your arms and shoulders. So we get to see mostly shoulder and uh, arm injuries. So swimmers, uh, shoulder, shoulder injuries will be 80 to 90% in swimmers. Pectoral muscle strain, neck strain, acromial, acromioclavicular joint strain. These are mostly common in swimmers. Common injuries in gymnast will be ankle sprain, uh, low back pain, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, ACL strain or tear, wrist injuries and neck injuries. Common injuries we get to see in badminton and tennis would be elbow strain, lateral and medial epicondylitis 
because uh, mostly uh, the players will be uh, using their dominant uh, arm so mostly elbow and uh, medial uh, elbow strain and lateral and medial epicondylitis will be seen angle injury angle injuries and sprain knee injuries wrist strain So uh, we move on to sports injury assessment. Sports injury management uh, cannot be done without an assessment. So first we need to do a, a proper assessment, then we can uh, do a proper management. So sports injury assessment is uh, divided into primary assessment and secondary assessment. Primary will be the first assessment we do when a sports player get, goes down. So it is used to check whether the injuries are life-threatening or not. So we follow the mnemonic D-R-S-A-B-C-D. D stands for danger. We remove the player from the danger site. R stands for response. We check whether the player is responding either to call or tap or touch. We C, for, uh, C stands for call. We call the ambulance in case the player does not react or we can also call someone nearby for assistance or for them to make a call to the hospital to send an ambulance. A stands for airway evaluation. We check the airway. If the tongue is falling back on the throat, we clear the airway and then uh, uh, after that we go for B, which is breathing evaluation. We check whether the player is breathing or not properly. The breaths are uh, normal and uh, after that C, stands for circulation, we check for heart rate, we check for pulse, and D stands for defibrillation. In case the player is not responding, we uh, use a defibrillation machine. What are the serious life-threatening sports injuries? Some injuries lead to fatal life-threatening conditions, sometimes leading to death of the player on the way to the hospital or on the ground. What are the uh, threatening uh, sports injuries? Airway obstruction, uh, respiratory failure, cardiac arrest, severe heat, cold or cold injury, head injury, cervical spine injury, severe bleeding. So these can lead to your uh, loss of life. Emergency on-field pr procedure. On-field, when a player goes down, we follow these protocol. First, we st stabilization. Head and spine or fracture area is stabilized. Then we check for airways, we check for ventilation, then we check for circulation, we check for heart rate, then we go and check for bleeding. In case of excessive bleeding, uh, we stop the bleeding so that the player does not go for hypovolemic shock. We check pupils in case we uh, doubt any neurological injuries. Uh, we assess for spinal cord injuries, check for head injuries. We position the patient uh, in a comfortable position then we assess the movement, uh, which part of the uh, joint, which part of the body is affected, and we assess the body part movement. Lastly, we assess the heat injury. CPR, so cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation is a life-saving technique that is useful in many emergencies, such as a heart attack or near drowning experience, in which someone's breathing or heartbeat has stopped. So uh, we follow a step-by-step -step protocol for CPR. First, we call an ambulance or we ask someone to call an ambulance. Then we lay the person on their back and check, open their airways, check their airways and open their airways. After that, if they are not breathing, we, uh, we have to start the CPR. CPR is what? CPR is 30 chest compressions. We give 30 chest compression, which is of two inches of depth, two inches deep on the chest, we give 30 compressions, and then after 30 compression, we go for two rescue breaths. And the uh, compression should be given at a rate of at a rate of 100 compressions per minute. So we repeat this compression, chest compression, and rescue breath until an ambulance arrives or an arrest. Next circulation. For a rapid assessment criteria for circulation will be. We check for skin color, whether the skin has the skin is pale or bluish. We check for carotid pulse palpable, femoral pulse palpable, radial pulse palpable. We uh, signs and symptoms of shock. In case of uh, shock, we 
uh, we check for these signs and symptoms increased or weak heart rate cold clammy pale skin increased shallow respiratory rate profuse sweating increased sweating increased thirst restlessness the player becomes restlessness or anxious there will be altered level of consciousness in the player the pupils will seem to be dilated or the player will feel vomiting or nauseous cervical spine injury situations in which cervical spine injury must be suspected until proven otherwise these all situations uh, tend to uh, point towards cervical spine injury until we prove it otherwise if the player feels any neck pain or stiffness cervical muscle spasm asymmetric or abnormal head position of the player in case there is any respiratory difficulty or the player is has gone unconscious or the player feels numbness or tingling or burning sensation over the arms and legs over the body muscle weakness or paralysis or loss of bowel or bladder control emergency signs and symptoms of uh, of a head injury uh, increased headache nausea vomiting inequality of pupils disorientation altered level of consciousness increased blood pressure decreased pulse rate decreased reaction to pain decreased or altered levels of neural watch chart or glasgow comma scale so concussion what is a concussion so concussion is a kind of a head injury it is a type of traumatic brain injury caused by a bump or jolt to the head or by a hit to the body that causes the head and brain to move rapidly back and forth so this sudden movement can cause the brain to bounce around inside the uh, uh, cranium and uh, that causes uh, chemical changes in the brain and sometimes stretching and damaging the brain cells so what is uh, the concussion can be measured by crt5 which can be uh, assessed by non medical trained individuals to recognize the signs and symptoms of possible sport related concussion or scat5 is also used these are used by medical professionals and it's standardized tools to aid in evaluation of athlete, athlete, athletes suspected for having sustained a concussion so scat5 has immediate on field assessment of field assessment student or athlete background assessment glasgow comma scale assessment self reported symptoms cognitive and neurological screening and a balance measure so this is your crt5 which can be used by any non medically trained individuals on the field in case they suspect any concussion on the uh, players moving on signs of heat injury heat injury can be uh, the signs uh, vary there are various uh, signs and symptoms to show uh, the player has undergone heat injury the player shows muscle cramps excessive fatigue or weakness loss of coordination headache decreased comprehension dizziness nausea or vomiting or decreased reaction time so no movement sequence to remove a mobile athlete from the field of play an athlete goes down and how do we move the athlete out of the field of play so first uh, athlete will be mostly in supine lying comfortably lying so we ask the player to come up and sit sit uh, we give him support and after that we ask him to move to kneeling kneeling supported we give him support and we ask him to go for four point kneeling on his hands and uh, knees after that we ask him to go for two point kneeling only on your knees then we ask him to slowly stand up giving him support then we try to remove uh, our support and ask him to stand independently and we walk him off the field if assistance is required we give him assistance so the stop principle 
after an injury we follow the stop principle that is stop the athlete s stands for stop the athlete from participating or moving we uh, stop the athlete from uh, moving or participating in the sport t talk to the athlete what happened how did it happen where is the injury how did the injury occur so we ask the injury history o will be observe we observe the general injury site whether there is any uh, uh, bleeding any swelling any change any fractures so we observe after that p p stands for prevent further further injury by doing a detailed toe taps assessment this is the secondary assessment so the toe taps assessment is it's a mnemonic uh, which is uh, t stands for talk to the patient we talk to the patient about the history of the injury where did it occur how did it occur uh, and uh, where is the pain we observe observe the injury site whether there is any swelling whether there is any redness any change in uh, color any bleeding any fracture site t is for stands for touch we palpate the area and is pain swelling etc we check for next we check for active movement active movement is whether the player is uh, able to move the uh, limb actively or not or the uh, limb is uh, limited to the pain range passive movement will be if the player is not able to move the limb actively we uh, we um, move the limb uh, we will move the limb for the player and we'll check whether the uh, limb is able to move through its full range of motion or not or it's limited by pain next we if everything is normal we go for special test or skill test according to the uh, game musculoskeletal assessment so uh, in musculoskeletal assessment it's a detailed assessment we perform on a player to check whether there is any uh, stiffness there is any uh, joint uh, play joint play uh, restrictions any decreased or increased range of motions any change deviations in posture so we do all the all these tests first we check, go ask for patient history in case there is any injury any shoulder injury low back injury ankle injuries history so we check, uh, ask for patient history after that observation we observe the posture of the player the joint position of the player whether it's normal or it's deviated examination of the movement various examinations are done like range of motions will be performed then um, manual muscle testing will be performed to check the strength to check the uh, flexibility of the muscles after that special tests are performed on various muscles and joint to check their uh, again strength and uh, their limitations reflexes and cutaneous distribution will be checked in case we doubt any neurological injuries joint play movements will be again checked in if they are limited or there is increased joint play in the joints then palpation palpation can be done to palpate any uh, signs of tenderness or any swelling lastly diagnostic imaging like x rays mris can be done sports injury prevention first and foremost uh, we are supposed to prevent sports injuries prevention is better than cure so we go for warm up exercises warm up uh, exercises will be done before the training or before the sports before the competition so warm up exercises will be uh, will increase your blood and nutrient flow to the muscles it improves uh, neuromuscular functioning it disperses synovial fluid across joints aiding movement it mirrors sport specific movement it increases concentration the types of warm up exercises would be slow jogging or stretching now the cool down exercises can be done after the competition or training it promotes venous return the muscle lactate removal will increase it improves flexibility and relaxation to the muscle so the cool down exercises will be mostly stretching sports injury prevention can also be done by various other methods like protective equipment or taping proper protective equipment should be used taping of uh, tape
taping or uh, taping is mostly supporting the injured areas. If the player has any injured uh, muscle or uh, joint, we'll tape the area so that there will be no further uh, injury to the uh, muscle. Appropriate surface. We ask the player to play in an appropriate surface. Appropriate training has to be given. Adequate recovery should be given for the player to recover the for uh, efficient uh, training. So regular fitness testing can, should be done like musculoskeletal testing and then uh, return to play testing. These will show the player's ability. Psychological training should also be given uh, to uplift the player psychologically. Meeting nutritional requirement. Nutritional, nutrition is also one of the important uh, component for sports injury prevention. The player should have sound sleep of at least seven to eight hours. Adequate water intake, which prevents cramping or muscle fatigue or dehydration. Sports injuries management. The first and foremost thing we uh, have to keep in mind is do no harm. Within the first seven days of an injury, we do no harm. Harm uh, stands for heat, no heat, uh, no uh, alcohol consumption, no running and no massage. The sports injury management method was RISE protocol, which was rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Then it moved on to price, that's protection, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Then the pricer protocol. Now the modern and modified method is police protocol. And the latest, which was uh, most, most, more recently, Dubious and SQLIR in 2019 proposed two new acronyms to optimize soft tissue recovery. That is peace and love. So it includes the full range of soft tissue injury management from immediate care to subsequent management. So the full form of peace and love will be, P stands for protection. Protection means unload or restrict movement of the joint uh, of the injured area for one to three days. Elevation, E stands for elevation. Elevation will be elevation of the affected area so that it increases the interstitial fluid flow out of the injury site. A stands for avoid anti-inflammatories. Uh, anti-inflammatories like analgesics and all should be avoided. And also now they say avoid ice. C stands for compression. Compression is intra-articular edema uh, and tissue hemorrhage will be uh, moved out to uh, uh, apply compression bandages. E stands for education. Education, educate the player for, for benefits of active approach to recovery. And then after a few days have passed, after the acute uh, stage has passed, we go for love protocol that is load load the area and uh, uh, movement and exercises and early mechanical stress is given to the area to uh, an optimal load will be given to uh, to the muscles affected muscles o stands for optimism uh, psychological and brain optimism is a must for the player to for recovery and uh, moving on to sports v stands for vascularization which includes Cardiovascular activity like running, jogging, and uh, this activity uh, should be increased and uh, promoted and which uh, will decrease the need for pain medications and which will improve the work status of the player. E st stands for exercise. Early mobilization will restore your mobility, strength, and proprioception by exercises. So sports injury management First, we uh, first there is conservative management, then uh, your medical or operative management. So conservative management includes sports injury ta taping to protect the area and increase proprioceptive feedback. There'll be there are various electrotherapy modalities which can be used to decrease pain and uh, increase tissue healing. We have tens, IFT, ultrasound, laser, heat, and cold packs, which uh, Nita Ma'am will be discussing to you all. Uh, later on. Exercise prescription and rehab exercises are a must for your management, sports injuries management. Medical operative management, in case the injury can't be managed by conservative measures, then the player can be referred for medical or surgical management. So 
the treatment according to the severity of the injury. If the injury is mild or grade one, we go for peace and love protocol. If the injury is moderate or grade two, we give braces. We ask the player to rest and then follow the peace and love protocol and uh, try to manage it conservatively. If it cannot be managed, we refer the player to uh, an orthopedician. If it's severe or grade three, we refer uh, directly refer the player to an orthopedician for surgical management. Phases of tissue healing. Tissue can uh, tissue healing occurs in various phases. First, uh, zero to two days will be your acute phase. There'll be scab, there'll be fibroblast and microphage formation and blood vessel will be ruptured. It is called the inflammatory phase. Then we see the subacute phase. Uh, it ranges from three to seven days to six weeks. This is the repair phase where repair, repairing and uh, prol proliferation uh, of the fibroblast will be occurring and uh, the tissue will be in a repairing phase. Chronic phase lasts from seven days or four weeks to six months. Here we see the remodeling phase, re remodeling of the epidermis and der dermis of the skin uh, will take place in this stage. So in acute phase, what do we do? In acute phase, we follow the peace and love protocol again. Then we give some passive range of motion exercises that is uh, done by a physiotherapist or uh, somebody who's nearby the player, which can be slowly progressed to active range of motion exercises. But we, uh, uh, we ask the player to try to move the uh, limb actively as much as possible. If it's not able to move the limb, then we go for passive range of motion exercises. Then isometric exercises, uh, that is in uh, one particular range, the player is supposed to try to contract the muscle without moving the joint. So these are isometric exercises which are given to the player. Will uh, This will increase healing, increase muscle strength, and also uh, increase circulation and decrease the joint uh, swelling. Gentle stretching can be given till pain limit. Too much uh, stretching should not be given in acute phase. Non-weight bearing exercises can be given for lower limbs in case lower limb is involved. Modalities can be used like tens or laser. Tens can be used for to reduce your pain sensation and laser can be used to uh, increase your proliferation and healing. So subacute phase. In subacute phase, we go for isotonic exercises. Uh, isotonic exercises can be concentric first, then uh, we go for eccentric exercises. Uh, concentric is the shortening exercise, shortening of the muscle length and eccentric will be lengthening of the muscle length. Stretching till full range of motion. We push till full range of motion and try to gain normal range of motion of the joint uh, in this phase. Resistance exercises, uh, resistance can be given by various therabands and weights we can uh, use. Active range of motion exercises is performed. Partial weight bearing should be initiated and then uh, which will be progressed to full weight bearing as tolerated in lower limb injuries. Various modalities we can use in this phase will be ultrasound, tens, IFT, laser, pulse, short wave diathermy. The chronic phase. Later, uh, as the player progresses, we go for stretching exercises till full range of motion Full uh, range of motion has to be attained in this phase. Mobilization and manipulation of various joints can be given. PNF uh, exercises and uh, uh, muscle energy technique can be performed to increase the strength of the uh, muscles. Progressive exercises has to be given in this uh, phase. Neural mobilization can be given in if there's any neural uh, involvement. We can use dry needling and cupping for uh, to increase healing and sports skill uh, specific exercises can be given and plyometrics and ballistic exercises can also be included and agility drills can be included in this uh, so that we, uh, may, uh, we can uh, make the player return to play uh, earlier. Modalities can, various modalities can be used like ultrasound, short wave diathermy, IFT, laser, shock with therapy according to the physiotherapist uh, need. So the progression of rehabilitation. To progress an athlete's program, we should consider following parameters. The type of activity the athlete is performing. Type, uh, type of activity can be your plyometrics, closed kinematic or uh, open kinematic 
or running uh, activity and duration of activity duration of activity has also be to be progressed duration means uh, initially the player might be exercising for 5 to 10 minutes that has to be progressed to uh, to 25 20 minutes to 30 minutes frequency of activity or rest intensity uh, can all has also to be increased the complexity of activity from single plane movement to multiple plane movement uh, should be uh, progressed lastly return to play to, uh, we perform a return to play test uh, for the player to return to play we have to perform some return to play test on the player in order to make sure that the athlete is fit to play the sport without any further injury so athlete should be able to participate in 70 to 90 percent of the normal training load with confidence full confidence so this decision depends upon the combined decision of physio trainer coach doctor and psychologist so return to play can be according to the level of participation or according to what the athlete aims to return to firstly there'll be return to participation in which the athlete is able to return to participate but is not ready medically physically or psychologically next is return to sport it uh, the player is able to return to sport but is but he is not uh, reaching the target level of performance max performance uh, he is not able to reach third will, third will be lastly uh, return to performance return to performance is performing at or better than the pre injury level the player is uh, performing at his level best so this is the uh, if the player is able to return to performance that is the maximum the player can attain so the, with this, we come to an end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I think if there's any questions. Okay. Okay, thank you so much to our thank speaker. You, thank you so much, Madam, Ms. Shireen Rai on your topic, sports injury management. We learned a lot and so much learnings from sports injuries, the types of sports injuries, the different uh, assessment, no? Also the, the, mas the type of sports injury management. So at this juncture, may I request, okay? May we present the certificate of appreciation to our speaker? May I request, please? Okay. Let me read the citation. International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with knowledge partner Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital present the Certificate of Appreciation to Ms. Shireen Rai for sharing her precious time and effort as resource speaker during the conduct of the International Conference on Sports Injury Prevention with a the theme, Effective, Safe Therapeutic Treatment Approaches in Achieving Optimal Performance of Athletes organized by the International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with knowledge partner Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital, given this 10th day of July 2021 via Zoom platform. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Thank Ms. You so. Shirin Ray. Thank you. Okay. So moving on, moving on for our second speaker this afternoon, this morning and afternoon, an instructor of physiotherapy department of Isfahan University from um, Iran. Let's all welcome. Dr. Hamzi Baharlui from Isfahan University in Iran. Good day, sir. 
Dr. Hamzi, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Go Hello. Ahead. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Do, do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And uh, did you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, let me begin my presentation. First of all, please accept my deep appreciation for having me in this uh, conference, in this valuable conference. Thanks a lot for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, let me speak about the effect of TDCS on improving function in uh, athletes. TDCS is a new but old uh, technique in the neuroscience. In the 21st century, new training techniques inspired by advances in neurosciences have been developed. Among them, the use of non-invasive brain stimulation initially developed for clinical purposes has expanded to the field of sport performance. The most common technique. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. Your PowerPoint is not moving, sir. Uh, do you now see the second PowerPoint or not? Um, what we see in our screen, sir, is the picture. A picture. Um, you are thanking for the attention in um, written with your email. Sir, you can go back to uh, slide number two if you are discussing on that mm -hmm. uh, part, sir. Do you know so the slide number two or not? Or not? Sir, the I'm slide now showing uh, the computer. Is it okay or not yet? Sir, can you re, um, reshare your screen as well again so that um, okay. the PowerPoint would be moving? Thank you, sir. Okay. I stopped sharing and I'm going to share it again. Is it okay? Not yet, sir. Not yet? <laughs> we can see your presentation as of now, sir. We cannot see the presentation. I, I am going to reshare it again to uh, try to correct this technical problem. Uh, what do you see now?
Now we can see your screen. Yeah, we can see your screen, sir. It or now or no? Yes, we can see your screen now, sir. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. And you see the second slide or not? Yes, sir. We can see the second slide already, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. 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 Let's continue. Sir, your voice is not clear. Sir, your voice is not clear, sir. We can we can hear you, sir, sir now. Sir, what you can do is um, you can turn off your video so that uh, it would not affect the bandwidth of your um, internet connectivity. Hello, sir. What happened, sir? Not audible. Only one slide is there in the screen. Hello, sir. Some technical issues may be there. Dr. Hamzi, please. Sir, I think it is better if we allow him uh, after one or uh, one presentation. In between, we are able to connect with him more clearly. He will audible and visible as well. So in between, without uh, taking wasting time, we can allow our next speaker. I think Dr. Bharat Kumar B is there in the uh, room. You can allow him also. Dr. Jeeverson, please.
Okay. Due to some technical problems in the poor internet connectivity, um, let's move on to our third speaker. Our third speaker is the sports physiotherapist of NCOE Department of Sports. Of Department of Sports Science, Sports Authority of India. Let's all welcome with her topic, prevention of sports injuries. Let's welcome Ms. Nita Kavuluri. Madam, please, thank you. Good morning, sir. Am I audible? Yes, madam, you're audible. Go ahead, okay. please. I just share my screen. Sir, can you see my screen? Yes, madam. Make it large. Madam, please make it large. Okay, sir. Please allow full screen. I, I know. I, just a minute, sir. Sir, is it okay now? Yes, sir. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. A very good afternoon to Director of International Association of Physical Education and Sports, National Secretary of uh, Physical Education Foundation of India, and uh, respected uh, and honorable chief guest, and of course, respected Kishore sir, because he was the person to contact me and allow me to speak in this platform and all the esteemed members who are present in this webinar on Zoom. I'm really thankful and express my gratitude to the organizer to give me a chance to be uh, present among you. Thank you very much. So the topic I'll be speaking on today is therapeutic modalities applied in sports. Now, since today's topic is about sports rehabilitation, I would just like to say that uh, using therapeutic modalities is just a part of it but since i've been asked so i'll definitely go elaborate this part also because along with the therapeutic modalities exercise therapy plays a very major role as already discussed by Ms. Shireen. so uh, before i start i would like to say that golden bird a british medical doctor and frcp he started electrotherapy at guy's hospital london in the mid 19th century and later he moved from large doses to moderate doses for effective result. And from then hence, uh, electricity is used, um, uh, uh, the various modalities are used by using electricity uh, for the rehabilitation of the sports injuries, uh, various sets of musculoskeletal injury, including sports injury. So the therapeutic modalities used in sports are the tools used by physical therapists to achieve their goal. Now, in our case, the goal is to make the player return to his uh, field of play in his pre-injury state, or rather better in terms of strength, endurance, coordination, proprioception, uh, etc. So the therapeutic modalities, they use electrophysical agents to create physiological effects like increased blood circulation. As we know, for any type of healing, the most important part is to increase the blood circulation because along with the arterial blood goes oxygen, nutrition to the cells, which will help in the healing of the tissues. It will reduce pain, swelling, and muscle spasm. As a result of the reduction of the pain, swelling, it will increase the mobility of the part. And with the mobility, we continue with the exercise to increase the strength. And it also helps to re-educate the muscle. And with the venous return, there will be disposal of the accumulated metabolites, which are caused by inflammation. Now, the modalities are used according to the condition of the player, his needs and goals. And the modalities which we use are electrical stimulation, cryotherapy, thermotherapy, ultrasound therapy, laser, and extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So first going to the paradox uh, electrical stimulation. 
Now, the paratic and galvanic are mostly used to stimulate muscles and TENS and IFT, TENS is the acronym for transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation and IFT for interferential therapy. These two are used for pain relief. So first I'll move on to paratic stimulation. Now, as you see, this is a uh, uh, machine, parad it's a stimulator where both galvanic and paratic stimulation is given and it is given by application of this electrodes over the skin by applying this gel because that gel helps the better transmission of the electrical stimulation and this is a needle electrode which we use for facial muscles in case of Bell's palsy or facial palsy where there is a weakness of the muscle and so externally stimulation is given to make the ma uh, muscles um, uh, perform its normal function. Now Paradox stimulation is an interrupted direct current that has a frequency of 50 to 100 hertz. Pulse duration is from 0 to 1 millisecond. The frequency and duration cause contraction and relaxation of innervated muscles, means muscles whose nerve supply is intact. Now, we know the muscle always should have a proper nerve supply to perform its function. Now, sometimes it happens so that even with an intact nerve supply, because the nerve muscle has been not moved for a longer time, say if the muscle is within the plaster cast or due to some degenerative disease, the muscle has not moved. So, in that case, it has to be moved um, uh, passive, in the passive form. So, in that case, paradigm stimulation is given. It causes stimulation of the sensory nerve. It causes a vasodilation and increased blood circulation. Stimulation of the motor nerve. It causes contraction of the muscle distal to the point of stimulation. And the character of the response depends upon the nature and strength of the impulse as well as the pathological state of the muscle. Paradigm currents are always searched to produce near normal contraction and relaxation. Surging means gradual increasing and decreasing the peak intensity. Then coming to the indications of paradigm stimulation. Now we often find in sports that uh, because of any muscular injury, muscle strain grade 1, 2 or ligament injury or tendon injury or any sort of injury of the soft tissue, uh, initially, in the acute state, we avoid movement because any cause of any type of movement which flare up the inflammation. But after the acute stage is over, then we have to encourage movement. That means the move, uh, contraction of the muscle. In that case, if the muscle doesn't contract due to pain or some condition, that time we have to facilitate movement, which is inhibited by pain due to this injury. Muscle re-education. Now, paradigm stimulation helps to bring about to bring about a passive movement in the muscle, which has not been used due to say fractured immobilization or due to certain uh, muscular disease. And then the muscle is stimulated to muscle is made to learn its old action because if a muscle is left for a long time without contraction there will be inhibition of the muscle action. So in that case, we give paradigm stimulation to educate the muscle to do its old action because our brain understands uh, movement and not muscle action. So when paradigm stimulation is given, it will passively bring about the movement, which is voluntarily not possible by the player. Then training a new muscle action. Now what happens in uh, certain sports, suppose in gymnasts, a male gymnast while doing ring exercise, there may be a vigorous contraction of the biceps brachii muscle and there may be grade 3 tear of the muscle. Now, if that tear is not looked after immediately, there may be retraction of the ends of the muscle and then it becomes very difficult for the surgeon to again bring the two ends of the muscle and suture it. So in that case, the muscle has to be transplanted. In most cases, we have seen that in case of biceps brachii undergoing grade 3 tear, gracilis muscle which is a hip adductor, is transplanted with its proper artery and venous supply is brought in the position of the bicep muscle to perform a new action and that is elbow flexion. And that, that time, the, to re-educate the muscle to learn a new action, the paradigm stimulation is given and the player also is uh, made to encourage to uh, voluntarily participate in the uh, muscular action so that with the proper consciousness and stimulation, the player can get back the proper muscle action of the 
biceps instead of biceps brachii the gracilis will take over the elbow flexion that improvement of venous and lymphatic drainage now in more the most important drawback after any injury if not properly taken care of is swelling and edema now in this swelling and edema if it is in the lower extremity it is really detrimental for the player to again come back because since the um, venous return has to flow anti gravity it becomes very difficult for the player to get rid of the swelling so in that case we give paradic stimulation which will encourage the venous and lymphatic drainage then prevention and loosening of adhesion same if after uh, injury if there is a swelling and there is lack of movement what happens the uh, tissue layers sometimes due to lack of movement get adhered to each other so in that case if we give proper paradic stimulation that will cause movement of the structures with respect to each other and excuse me prevent formation of uh, adhesion relaxation of muscle that is passive recovery with active component now in sports passive active recovery is always preferred to passive recovery there are various methods of passive recovery like massage sauna but passive active recovery is mostly uh, encouraged that active recovery means active stretching loosening these are the active methods of recovery so in case we with the paradic stimulation though it is a passive mode because the contraction is done within the body but it is through a passive um, way because the person himself or herself is not contracting the muscle but there is contraction so it has a active component next i move on to the contraindications in any type of skin wound if it is a open wound we don't give paradic stimulation because that may cause uh, um, accumulation of the electricity at the site of the wound in case of acute inflammation as i told you any acute inflammation we do not move disturb that area because if that area is disturbed the inflammation will flare up so uh, during acute inflammation we don't give any stimulation we give in the subacute stage in case of thrombosis any movement may cause dislodging of the thrombus so it is not given if there is a loss of sensation uh, then the player will not understand at what intensity the stimulation should be taken and there may be chances of burn and shock so that should be prevented and superficial metals below the application of stimulation because any metal will cause a um, hindrance to the flow of electrical stimulation now next i, I will discuss about galvanic stimulation it is a interrupted direct current that has a frequency of 30 hertz pulse duration is 1 millisecond or more the pulse duration is more than the paradic stimulation the frequency and duration cause contraction of the denervated muscle that is muscle without nerve supply due to injury of the nerve sometimes in sports it happens that due to certain vigorous action the either the nerve gets compressed by the contraction of the other muscles or the nerve may get severed so in that case if the nerve supply to the muscle is not present the muscle cannot perform its function but we do. but if the muscle doesn't perform its function the muscle will get weak so in that cases we give galvanic stimulation because the denervated muscle takes a longer time to contract so the pulse duration is more than the paradic stimulation now indications are it maintains a property of the muscle and it retards degenerative atrophy because if skeletal muscles are not moved for some time there is a chance of atrophy atrophy means it loses its volume and there may be certain degenerative changes in the muscle and that will prevent a player from again going back to the ground because time is very precious for a sports person so in that case we do not take any chance we start giving galvanic stimulation it helps the muscle to maintain nutrition by increased blood supply it improves absorption and activates the pumping function of the muscle it prevents venous and lymphatic stasis because again if there is stasis of the venous and lymph there will be again formation of swelling so to avoid that we give galvanic stimulation maintaining maintaining the working hypertrophy of the denervated muscle now what happens when a muscle hypertrophic muscle is suddenly denervated it doesn't lose its hypertrophy in a day or two so in that case we continue giving galvanic stimulation to maintain the hypertrophy of the muscle till the muscle is regenerated it maintains the extensibility of the muscle it prevents development of contracture now when a muscle is not contracted uh, muscle does not perform its normal function the muscle always tends to rest itself in its shortest position 
and due to its shorter, shorter position, it will have an effect on the joint. The angle of the joint will reduce, and there are chances of development of flexion contracture at the joint. So to avoid that, and once a flexion contracture is developed, it's very difficult to maintain, again, break back the normal range of motion. So to avoid uh, the development of contracture, we give galvanic stimulation. It improves range of motion and education of the muscle. And endophoresis is a technique where there is a drug transfer through the skin due to voltage gradient on the skin. Now, contraindications are nearly similar to Faradic. If there is any type of skin infection, that will again accumulate the electricity and we cannot give if there is any skin disease, skin disease or any skin disorder. Impaired skin sensitivity, this will again cause the, the player will on, not understand the intensity and there may be chances of burn. It's metal implant, it will resist the uh, application of stim, uh, movement of the, the stimulation through the metal thrombosis and skin infection. And the dangers are burn, erythema means redness of the skin and electric shock. Now I am coming to the first two types of stimulation were mainly to stimulate the muscles, to perform the muscular contraction. The next two uh, type of electrical stimulation, which I'll be discussing, is TENS and IFT, and both helps to reduce pain. TENS use low voltage electric current for symptomatic relief. Frequency ranges from 80 to 120 cycles per second. The electric current stimulates nerve cells that block the transmission of pain signal, modifying the perception of pain using pain gate theory. This is the main principle, that is the pain gate theory is the main principle on which TENS works which I'll elaborate. And the nerve stimulation also raises the level of endorphins, which are our body's natural pain killing chemical. The endorphins then run the perception of pain. High frequency is given in the acute pain or acute condition and low frequency is given in chronic pain. Now, if you see here is a gymnast, uh, Pranuti Naik, who is uh, uh, bound for Tokyo Olympics. And as she is doing vigorous practice and because of the muscular pain, tense is given to reduce the pain. Now, indications are if there is any inflammation of the tendon. Bursitis, if it is a the overused, uh, bursitis due to overuse. Uh, bursa, as you know, these are small sacs, air filled sacs, which are present between the muscle and bone to prevent friction. Sometimes, due to overuse injury, this bursa gets inflamed. And they, um, due to their inflammation, they give pressure to the neighboring tissues and it causes pain. In that case, we give tends to reduce the pain. In case of any muscle injury, grade 1, 2 low back pain and fibromyalgia. Now here I will just explain you the concept of pain gate theory, which is proposed by Melzack and Wall. I will rather explain you through this diagram. Now, pain sensation is carried by the small slow C fibers to the spinal cord into the brain. And the large A beta fibers, they mainly carry non-pain stimuli like scratch, rub, uh, touch, etc. Now, this A-beta fibers, they have an effect on this C fibers. And this A-beta fibers, they create a hypothetical gate in the spinal cord. Uh, and this gate open or close to the pain sensation through the C fibers. Now, this gate, which the hypothetical gate which I'm talking about, is mainly stimulated by the non-pain uh, sensory signals carried by this A-beta fibers. Now, when we apply the tense, the electrical stimulation, it stimulates the A-beta fibers and this in turn closes the gate at the spinal cord to for the transmission of pain through the C fibers. So this is the mechanism of uh, pain control by giving tense by gate control theory. Now the contraindications are we cannot give um, uh, tense over any area of undiagnosed pain, since we are not sure, we cannot give any electrical stimulation to that area. Any metal implant, again, this will cause a hindrance and not over chest area. Now, the next uh, uh, modality which I'll be discussing is called IFT. Now, interferential therapy. IFT has an added advantage over tense. It uh, uh, causes reduction of pain by pain and pain control, uh, gate uh, control theory, as well as there is some muscle contraction. In TENS, there is no muscle contraction, but in IFT, there is an added advantage of muscle contraction. Now, IFT uses, utilizes two medium frequency alternating currents passing through the tissue simultaneously so that their paths cross and they interfere with each other. This interference gives rise to a beat frequency, which is an amplitude modulated, low frequency resultant current. 
Now in IFT, what we do, we give two medium frequency current, which are of different uh, intensities. And the uh, two uh, medium frequency currents are given superficially of the skin. And when these intensity currents go inside, they cross and the resultant, that it means the difference between the two is actually the therapeutic frequency. Mostly we give around say 4,000 Hertz and 3,900 Hertz. If these two medium frequencies are given, they cross inside the body and the resultant frequency, which is say 100 Hertz, is a therapeutic frequency which is used. Now, why they give medium frequency? It is because the medium frequency current causes very low impedance on the skin surface. And so there is no irritation on the skin. But at the same time, we need a therapeutic frequency. So, which is around 80 to 100 hertz. So, this way, IFT is very beneficial. It will not irritate the skin on the superficial level. At the same time, we are getting the therapeutic purpose at the deeper level where it is required. Now, the physiological effects uh, IFT causes, it increases blood circulation. It increases the metabolic rate that increases the lactic recovery caused by the inflammatory reaction. It reduces edema. Pain relief is by activating opioid mechanism. Opioid acts both pre-synaptically and post-synaptically and have an analgesic effect. Now, they will block the calcium channel to the nociceptive afferent fiber and also they will um, uh, uh, inhibit the release of the neurotransmitter. And at the same time, they will block the C5 one, that is the pain gate theory. And together with the uh, advantage of IFT is muscle stimulation. It may cause uh, small twitches to tetanic contraction. Now, the contraction should not exceed, exceed the fatigue level. Next is indications. I told you as it is a stimulation, we cannot give in the acute condition. So it is given in subacute condition in case of any muscle strain, any muscle injury, any ligament injury, tendon, capsule, whatever injury, we can give um, IFT to reduce pain. It can be given in any sort of edema, inflammation, tennis elbow. Tennis elbow is actually lateral epicondylitis. It, most, it is the name is given tennis elbow because it mostly happens to the tennis. It is because of the vigorous um, uh, wrist extensor, which is mostly used in the tennis. So the wrist extensor are attached to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Now, due to this vigorous action, sometimes few muscle fibers at the junction of the musculotendinous junction, they come out of their point of insertion and there is severe pain. So in that case, we combine IFT with other modality, but IFT works very good to reduce the pain around in the tennis elbow. Then piriformis muscle impingement. Piriformis is a muscle which is below the voluminous gluteus maximus muscle. Now, sometimes due to, in case of printer, due to vigorous action, there is a sudden tightness of the gluteus maximus muscle and which presses on the piriformis muscle between the gluteus maximus muscle and say the sciatic nerve and there is a severe pain. So in that case, we give IFT because IFT will help to reduce the pain. At the same time, it will cause contraction of the tight glutes and that will release the pressure on the piriformis muscle. Then any sort of overuse injury because in sports, uh, overuse injury is very common because sometimes the player does not get proper recovery. And we know the player, uh, though they are asked to sleep for say 8 to 10 hours at night, but nowadays because of this, internet they are more into this mobile and movies and so they do not take sufficient rest and due to that what happens continuously if it goes like this due to lack of rest a time will come when the muscle gives up that, that type of injury is known as overuse injury it is not due to a single sudden um, incident it is a chronic phase where the injury gradually develops so in case of overuse injury also we can give ift any sort of muscle prespasm and to release the myofascial trigger points. Contraindications are arterial disease, acute injury, thrombosis, dermatological condition because any sort of dermatological condition we do not give any type of stimulation. Psychological disorder, the player will not understand at what intensity it should be taken and so there may be chances of burn and shock. Now, next I move to thermotherapy. The modalities are shortwave diathermy, hot magnet, and paraffin, which I'll be discussing today. Shortwave diathermy 
it's an electromagnetic energy. The frequency is 27.12 hertz, and it has a long wavelength of 11 meter. And because of this long wavelength, the penetration of short wave diathermy is very deep. The current is generated in a machine circuit, which in turn is coupled to a patient circuit used to treat the player with pain and injury. It causes deep and through heating. Through heating means, suppose this player who, uh, where I am giving him uh, short wave and I have placed the electrodes in the contraplanar position, means in the two opposite sides of the part which is being treated. And if the electrodes are placed in this way, the heat which is transmitted by conduction is through and through. And if it is placed coplanar, means side by side, then it causes deep heating. So short wave diathermy, because uh, we prefer short wave diathermy because at home when we give hot fermentation, that penetration is very minimum. Actually, the heat fermentation we mostly give at home has a placebo effect. But when we are, there is an injury and a player comes to a department, we always prefer to do short wave diathermy because it is causes a deep heating of the tissue. But again, it should not be given in acute condition because any form of heat will only aggravate the inflammation. So, and heat is transferred by conduction method from the electrode pads. Now, in the short wave diathermy unit, there is mainly two types of circuit, oscillator and resonator circuit. And when these two circuits are in tune with each other, there is maximum generation of power. Now, the physiological effects are the intensity of the current will be direct heating of the tissues. As you know, with the heat, there will be increased blood supply. And when the increased blood supply, there will be increased metabolic activity. It will facilitate the lactate recovery, healing of the tissues. The temperature is increased from 41 to 45. And with the increased temperature, will induce some relaxation in the muscle. The muscle efficiency will increase. This will promote healing. It will reduce muscle spasm, increase range of motion, reduce pain. It increases the elasticity of connective tissue. And the most important, it will relieve domes. Now, dome is a happy pain, which is called delayed onset of muscle soreness. Domes is, in sports, we call it a happy pain because domes is caused when a player learns a new technique or skill, there is a new pattern of movement of the muscle, which the muscle, the movements which the muscle was not habituated to. So in that case, what happens? There is a pain sensation within the muscle. Because of the new action of the muscle and the repeated action, the player feels pain. But this pain will not hinder the player's practice. So, but in some cases, uh, uh, the pain is so much that the player is reluctant to move into his next day practice. So in that case, we give short wave diathermy to reduce the pain. We give the, uh, heat in domes because domes is not an injury. That's why whenever a player comes and we assess the player and if we find it's a dome and it is the pain is not due to any injury, then we give short wave diathermy to reduce the pain. But this pain gradually re uh, reduces with consecutive days uh, practice. Indications are injuries involving muscles, joints, swelling, and pain. Now, again, I'm repeating, short wave is not given in acute condition. If it is a chronic injury, then we give short wave to reduce the pain and to facilitate movement, capsulation in case of arthritis, low back pain, and subacute inflammatory conditions. Next is contraindications. It is similar. It is deep vein thrombosis because that may cause dislodging of the thrombus. In, a, in any type of skin infection, Dermatitis, we cannot give short wave. In open wounds, skin sensation, impairment, severe cognitive impairment. The, in this cognitive impairment, the danger is that player cannot understand how much heat to take. And if the heat is more, there may be burn in case of short wave diathermy. And the deep is always, uh, the heat, burn is also a deep burn. So to avoid that, if the player has some a psychological disorder, we don't go for short wave diathermy. And if there is a metal implant, because um, electromagnetic energy cannot travel through metal. Danger is deep burn. The next I am going to discuss is hot magnet therapy. This has an added advantage over short wave because it has a vibration mode along with the electromagnetic energy. Now, hot magnet therapy it provides efficient control heating by using three elements, dry heat by conduction, magnetic force and electromagnetic energy. And the, this synergistic, uh, synergistic effect of the three elements will cause deep heating of the tissue. Now, the hot magnet unit, it generates a static, rhythmic, alternating pulse electromagnetic wave you know, energy, which will 
alter the electric potential of the nerves and cells and that will promote healing as well as reduce pain now the physiological effects of hot magnet is hot magnet acts on the cellular level when tissues are exposed to pulse magnetic field it activates a series of enzymatic reaction thus increases metabolism and when a metabolism is increased gradually the healing process starts pain is reduced by increased blood circulation reducing inflammatory reaction soothing effect in the tissue due to micro massage because the uh, 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 in short of diathermy we do not have any ma massaging effect but in uh, uh, hot magnet therapy we have a massaging effect and there gives a very soothing effect in on the tissues which are being treated softening of the collagen tissue by both heat and massage and acceleration of healing now indications are it can be given to any muscular injury low back pain in periarthritis shoulder overuse injury subacute injury with muscle tightness and bones contraindications are as it is a heat therapy we cannot give in the acute stage of the injury with metallic implant febrile condition skin sensitivity disorder and skin infection and now time and again i am talking about skin infection it is because in sports we most of the time we have found for younger players suppose uh, the player will below the age uh, of say 13 14 at the age of 13 14 they do not have much sense of hygiene and so sometimes what happen they come up with various types of fungal infection on their body so this we have often seen uh, in our department and that's why i uh, i mean again in every the modality i'm talking you about the skin infection it is because a skin infection is quite common among pl young players who have much, do not have much knowledge about skin hygiene for them uh, we have to be very particular about the type of treatment we give next coming to paraffin wax bath therapy this is a indigenous method and it is very effective for small joints of the body like knee elbow wrist foot and ankle uh, for any type of um a swelling or uh, pain which is caused uh, in the post uh, due to any post uh, sports injuries it is a combination of three items by weight paraffin wax petroleum jelly and liquid paraffin these three items are taken in the ratio of 3 to 1 is to 1 they either may be heated in this electrically modulated uh, 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 modality which is uh, seen shown here which has a thermostat or even these three items can be heated at home on a stove because this is treatment even uh, a player can even take it home the above three are heated together and it is applied over the affected area either by brushing brushing means uh, since when we heat the wax it becomes it, it 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 melts and in the molten form can be taken with the help of brush we brush over the area say suppose knee joint we brush the wax over the area but or if it is a small joints like interpharyngeal joints we can dip inside the liquid molten uh, wax or pouring method we can gradually pour but after applying the wax we have to take two precaution that is immediately after the application of wax the wax solidifies so what we have to do we cannot move the part the player is instructed not to move the part because if the player moves the part what happens there will be crack and the heat will be dissipated and so we allow the player not to move the part and we cover the area with a plastic paper plastic uh, cellophane or any plastic sheet so that the heat is retained for a longer time and then when the temperature comes to normal the wax is removed and it is again placed in the same place from where it is taken because wax can be uh, recycled the temperature should be around 40 to 45 degree centigrade now this form of uh, heat is very effective for um, uh, to bring about to do mobilization exercise following any stiffness of the joint now the previous two modalities which i have discussed like short wave diathermy and hot magnet they are a uh, dry form of heat now wax is a moist form of heat and this moist form of heat is very effective in softening the skin now what happens in fracture stiffness of the joint you cannot straighten the joint the range of motion is restricted now if the skin is softened that time it becomes easier for the therapist to perform the mobilization exercise so following any fractured stiffness wax is the very effective method of treatment which will help to reduce the pain because of its heat modality and because the heat is a moist it will soften the skin so any type of mobilization exercise becomes very easy so it helps to reduce pain swelling and increase the range of motion of the joint 
Now, contraindications are we always have to apply wax over clean and dry skin. Any type of sweat or any water droplets on the skin will accumulate the heat, and there may be chances of blister formation. So we have to be very particular. If you see that the player has a dry and clean skin, there should not be any open wound on the skin. Again, skin sensitivity disorder because the player will not understand to what, at what temperature he or she takes because the sensitive skin sensation is not same for all. And if there is a metal implant, now. Next, in all this, uh, while the modalities which I have discussed is mainly symptomatic relief and with some amount of healing. But the next three modalities which I'll be discussing today is mainly for the healing of the uh, injury uh, of the musculoskeletal injury which is faced by a player during his uh, sports participation. Now, ultrasound it uses sound energy. Pressure waves are caused by vibration of the piezoelectric crystal in the sonar head. Now, I will show you in the next. This is the ultrasound unit, and this is called the sonar head. Now, inside this sonar head, there is a piezoelectric crystal. Now, when electricity passes through the piezoelectric crystal, there is a vibration, and this vibration causes a sound wave, and with whose frequency is much higher than the audible sound. The flow and this sound wave it travels in a horizontal fashion with areas of compression and radiation. The flow of ultrasound may be uh, continuous, which is un in, a, in an uninterrupted stream that is a continuous mode, or it may be periodically interrupted that is called the pulsed mode. Now, when a player comes with an acute injury, suppose he or she has some game after a week, so that time we cannot uh, wait for the Player to uh, waste any time because that time we have to fasten up his uh, healing uh, process. Healing um, uh, process we have to start very early. So in that case we give pulse mode. So here as you see, pulse the ratio of one is to four. That means one second the ultrasound waves will pass and for the remaining four seconds there will be no passage of the sound wave. Now this acute stage we can start with the pulse mode and as you see. As we go up, the ratio gradually increases. Uh, sorry, the ratio gradually decreases from one is to four, then one is to three, one is to two, one is to one, and then after one is to one ratio, we can continue with the continuous mode of ultrasound. The ultrasound wo unit works with one megahertz, that is for the deep tissue whose wavelength, because the wavelength of one megahertz is 1.5 millimeter, that is a deeper penetrating, and for three megahertz, it is for the Superficial tissue because the penetration is around 0.5 millimeter. Now, next coming to the therapeutic benefits of ultrasound. First of all, ultrasound causes a thermal effect. The thermal effect is caused in the continuous mode because, as I told you, the sound wave travels in a horizontal fashion. So, areas of compression, there will be fast movement of the molecules, and that will cause a thermal effect, a heating effect uh, within the tissue that is injured. And the horizontal waves of ultrasound causes deep heating of the muscles, tendon, ligaments up to 4 degrees centigrade temperature and it increases blood circulation. Acoustic streaming, it causes uh, a small uh, adding of the vibrating fluid near the uh, cell membrane and thus increases this uh, vibration of the fluid will increase the cell permeability to oxygen and nutrition and that will also enhance the healing process. The micro massage is caused by the vibration, the horizontal uh, vibration of the sound wave and tissue repair. This is the most important part for the application of ultrasound. The tissue repair is mainly by three phases, inflammatory phase. Now, during by the application of ultrasound, the phagocytic activity of the inflammatory cells increases, that is mainly the macrophages. And when they are stimulated, they cause release of the chemical mediators like chemokines and cytokines. And this chemokines and cytokines will again uh, increase the uh, function of the fibroblast and myo endothelial cells proliferation. So in the proliferation phase, what happens? Because of the stimulation of the fibroblast and endothelial cells, there will be formation of the scar tissue and collagen synthesis. And in the remodeling phase, the generic scar tissue which is formed which is refined and gradually changes into the characteristics of the tissue that is repairing. For example, a scar ligament will become a ligament by orientation of the collagen tissues along the length of the 
um, uh, structure which is injured and the developing scar will change from type 3 to type 1 dominant fibers which will increase the tensile strength as well as the functional capacity of the tissue which is being uh, healed by the ultrasound application. Now, all this modality which I am discussing today, they are used on consecutive days and depends upon the rate of recovery. It is given, say, for about seven to eight days. It varies according to the uh, uh, intensity of the injury and the recovery, except the last, which I will be discussing later, which is not given on a regular basis. Now, indications are muscle and ligament strain, grade one to three. Now, what happens? Now, grade uh, now grade three tear means complete tear of the ligament or muscle. But sometimes, if the ends of the ligament or muscle do not um, uh, uh, change uh, its position, means if the alignment of the muscle remains uh, uh, is not disturbed much, then we do not the surgeon do not go for surgery. They go for immobilization. So in that cases, ultrasound helps in healing of this uh, tissue or ligament injury. And it works wonders for grade one and two. In any case of inflammation of the bursa, inflammation of the capsule, epicondylitis, then scar tissue healing, adhesion breaking, and release of joint contracture and burn contracture. As you see in bird, what happens? The tissue gets accumulated. And in such cases, we can give um, ultrasound to release the burn contracture. Contraindication. Though uh, continuous mode cannot be given in acute injury, but pulse mode of ultrasound can be given in the acute injury. Over bony prominences, ultrasound should never be given over any bony prominences because uh, bone, uh, there is a fine layer of periosteum over the bone. Now, if ultrasound is given over the bony prominences, there is a periosteal reaction. So, what happens? As I told you, in tennis elbow, the extensor group of muscles are attached to the lateral um, uh, um, epicondyle of the humerus. Muscles which uh, end up with the tendon, tendons are always attached on the bone. But whenever there is a tendon injury or the muscular injury, we never give ultrasound over the bony prominence or the bony area. We always give around the bony area over the tendons and the soft tissue. Because as I told you, bony area, there may be a periosteal reaction. Then it should not be given over thoracic area if the patient is using pacemaker, over ischemic tissue in patients with vascular disease because that the blood supply may not, uh, is unable to cope up with the metabolic demand and there may be necrosis of the tissue and patient with sensory loss. Now next I am coming to laser therapy. Laser is the acronym for light amplification for uh, the stimulated emission of radiation. Now in the therapy, therapeutic purpose, we use two types of laser. Helium neon laser, that is to treat superficial structures, 2 to 5 millimeter penetration. And gallium arsenide laser, that is to treat deeper structure, 1 to 2 centimeter penetration. Here you can see Shirin Rai, who is a physiotherapist and who is mainly now taking care of the um, uh, Olympian uh, Pronoti Nayak. And she is giving her laser. And as you see, both of them are wearing goggles. It is because laser rays are very harmful to the eyes. It may cause damage to the retina. So this is a precaution should be taken while giving laser rays. Now laser is a compressed light of wavelength from the cold red part of the spectrum of the electromagnetic radiation. It lies, sorry, um, it travels by the movement of photons through space. The laser, the characteristics of laser rays are monochromatic, means it is of single color with a single wavelength. Coherent means it always travels in a single line, and polaroid means uh, they are focused at a spot. Visible in the uh, wavelength in the visible range of 600 and 700 nanometer is mainly for the superficial lesion and from 700 to 1000 nanometer is for deeper lesion. Laser induces a biological response to energy transfer within the cells by a process called photobiomodulation. Now it is by this process of photo photobiomodulation, laser rays are very useful in the healing of the injured tissue. Now, the physiological effects are, it helps to reduce pain by increase the serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter which inhibits pain transmission to brain. Also, it decreases the bradykinin. It promotes tissue healing by increase the macrophage activity and fibroblast proliferation. It increases growth factor which stimulates cellular growth and healing. 
laser rays are also absorbed by the hemoglobin of the in the within the uh, uh, blood and uh, after the absorption of this uh, laser rays the hemoglobin releases nitric oxide which also helps in endothelial cell proliferation it helps in recovery from nerve injury due it accelerates nerve re regeneration increases rate of nerve conduction increases bone and cartilage formation by stimulation of bone morphogenetic protein that stimulates bone differentiation bone cell differentiation it reduces inflammation by enhancement of atp by stimulation of mitochondria increase angiogenesis that is new blood vessels are formed and as you know the blood if there is a increased blood supply to the area there will be more chances of healing now this is the electromagnetic spectrum and this is the visible ray uh, laser ray which is between the a wavelength of microwave and the x rays now indications are it helps to reduce pain and inflammation in ankle sprain tennis elbow plantar fasciopathy means plantar uh, fascia which is a, a thin layer of muscle uh, muscular uh, actually it's a fascia which is present at the sole of the foot uh, this plantar fasciopathy mostly occurs if a player do not have a proper footwear Now, if there are, there's a lack of uh, shock absorption in the footwear, or if the player is running on a hard surface, there are chances of uh, developing plantar fasciopathy, periarthritis, shoulder, release of myofascial trigger points, any soft tissue injury, inflammation. It can be used over metal implants. As all this while I have discussed with you, in any of the modality, we cannot use. If there is a uh, metal implant within the body, we cannot use other modalities except laser. laser can be used because metal do not cause any hindrance to the photon transmission it can be given uh, in neurogenic pain like trigeminal neuralgia neuralgia that is a pain over the facial muscles now contraindications though laser is very safe and can be used around pacemaker and metal implants but it cannot be used in case of pregnancy photosensitivity epilepsy due to visible red light in case of cancer epithelial growth plate disturbed with bone growth so in case of children we have to be very particular we cannot give laser um, uh, we cannot expose the injured part to the laser rays we have to find other modalities we can give laser only after bone growth is complete in any kind of skin abnormalities like tattoo or skin discoloration not over thyroid gland and dangers of laser are we all, there is only one danger that is it will uh, cause retina in a damage so in that case we should always wear goggles to protect our eyes the next i am going to discuss and this is the last modality which i'll be discussing today is extra corporeal shock wave therapy now i told you all this while the modalities which i have discussed we can use it on a daily basis but this extra corporeal shock wave therapy it cannot be used on every day basis it can be used only once a week or even or two days in 10 uh, twice in 10 days it it utilizes high energy acoustic pressure wave a single impulse will have a wide frequency range from 0 to 20 megahertz the higher frequency is 40 and above and lower frequencies are 13 and below it has a high pressure amplitude from 0 to 120 megapascal the physical characteristics of the waves are it has a high peak pressure no low tensile amplitude non linear and uh, the short duration of 10 milliseconds now the shock wave produces a positive phase where there is a direct mechanical phase and a negative phase that means where there is a rarefaction the, the and it will generate gas bubbles which will explode to give a generating a second wave now the therapeutic effects of um, uh, extra corporeal shock wave therapy it helps in for, uh, new blood vessel formation now we know that a uh, um, uh, neutron blood supply is required to initiate and maintain the healing process now application of this acoustic wave will cause capillary micro rupture at the tendon or bone or even at the muscle where the injury has taken place and this micro rupture will cause expression of the growth factor like vessel 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 endothelial growth factor or bone morphogenetic protein and as a result of this increase of the growth factor that will cause a angiogenic angiogenesis and there will be new vascularization means new blood vessels will be formed and as new blood vessels are formed there will be increased blood supply and that will help in healing then reversal of chronic inflammation now chronic inflammation takes place when normal inflammation has not halted 
Now we know in inflammation, mast cells are the key factor. Now when with the application of the sound wave, what happens? The mast cells are um, stimulated and they release this chemical mediators like chemokines and cytokines. And these uh, pro uh, chemical pro-inflammatory compounds will first uh, cause a flaring up of the inflammation. And in the next step, it will restore the inflammation. It will start healing and regeneration. Then stimulation of collagen production. Again, application of extracorporeal shockwave therapy will stimulate pro-collagen synthesis. Collagen tissues will be produced and they will be aligned along the line of the tissue which is injured, making the tissue more firm and strong. Dissolution of calcified by fibroblasts. Uh, calcium formation is sometimes the end product. Um, uh, the uh, cause of micro, uh, calcium formation may take place due to microtrauma or other causes of trauma. Suppose in, uh, if a muscle uh, injury takes place and if proper healing is not taken place, sometimes there is a calcium deposit or even in a fractured healing also, uh, we find that there will be calcium deposition. So in that cases, by application of this um, uh, shockwave therapy, there will be biochemical decalcification in the tendons and bones and the calcium granules will be uh, removed by the lymphatic system. Then dispersion of the pain mediator substance P. Now substance P will cause uh, increased stimulation of pain sensation through the nociceptive uh, peripheral nerves and it will cause uh, intense pain and also release of the neurotransmitters. So by application of again this assistive wave, there will be reduction of the substance P and as, as a result, there will be reduced stimulation through the uh, afferent nerve fibers and pain sensation will be less. Then release of the trigger points. The uh, release of the, actually it is a release of the myofascial trigger points. They are the cause, uh, main cause of pain in the case uh, 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 this pain can be felt in the neck, arm, lower extremity or back. Actually this pain are mostly due to uh, chronic injury. We do not find any myofascial trigger points uh, after any acute injury or if the injury has taken place in the first phase and the player returns with um, uh, complete healing of the injury. This trigger points or this uh, arises, suppose in, in sports we have most of the time we find that a player returns to the ground with 60 or 70 percent of recovery because they are always in a hurry to get back to the field again. So, uh, they, after getting, say, about 70% of recovery, they have an intense uh, chance of going back to the ground without proper recovery. And so, what happens? The injured tissue, which, has, which is incompletely healed, again gets prone to injury. In this way, the area becomes weak due to continuous re-injury. So, in that case, there is sometimes development of this myofascial trigger points. Now, they are actually palpable nodules in the uh, length of the muscle fascia and these uh, cells will have a very uh, uh, contracted sarcomere and they, the, these uh, muscles become so tight they sometimes become bending and it will cause uh, pain and this becomes a vicious cycle which is known as metabolic crisis. Now with the application of this um, uh, extracorporeal shockwave uh, energy uh, waves what will happen there will be uh, unblocking of the calcium pump and there will be reversal of this metabolic crisis at the myofilaments and that will help to release the trigger points. Shock wave can influence both at the neural level as well as the biological level. It has a transient analgesic effect on the afferent nerves. Now coming to the indications, it has a multiple indication but again I am telling you shock wave therapy cannot be given in the acute stage of injury. It should always be given in the chronic phase of injury and mostly it is given in overuse injuries. Injury where there is a structural change in the structure. Suppose, just for an example, I'm telling you, a player is having an ankle sprain and without getting complete 100% recovery, if the player goes back to the ground again, so that uh, ligament which is injured doesn't have the full strength to perform the function. So again, when load is given, uh, taken by that ligament, that the ligament cannot take the load and so it gets prone to injury again. So in this way, if there is a continuous injury, there are structural changes within the ligament, tendon or muscle. In that case, sh shock wave therapy works very good. 
it is not because uh, because of its high amplitude of the shock wave uh, it is not given in the acute stage of injury it is always given in the chronic stage of injury it is given in the case indications are tennis elbow piriformis syndrome greater trochanteric pain syndrome patellar tendinopathy osgood scatter disease uh, it is it happens when there is a sudden pull of the uh, patellar tendon over the tibial tubercle it mostly happens in um, adolescent players Achilles tendinopathy, bone spurs. Bone spur means bone growth, which is very common in calcaneal bone. We call it calcaneal spur. Then plantar fasciopathy, rotator cuff tendinopathy, hamstring tendinopathy, in myotibial stress syndrome, soft tissue adhesion, muscle knots, and myofascial trigger points. Now contraindications are uh, pregnancy, thrombosis. Again, there may be dislodge of the thrombus. There is a blood clotting disorder. intake of anticoagulants cancer growing children uh, large nerve large blood vessels osteoporosis if uh, shock wave is given there because of the bone in case of osteoporosis because of the lack of calcium in the bone there may be chances of fracture spinal column and metal implants now here i have given a small um, uh, difference as well as similarity between ultrasound and uh, extracorporeal shock wave therapy because uh, both are Uh, sound wave but there are some differences and similarities uh, ultrasound uses piezoelectric effect for generation of sound waves and it can be used in both acute and chronic stage of injury but uh, extracorporeal shock wave it uses mechanical effect to produce sound wave and it is used only in the chronic stage of injury uh, ultrasound produces both thermal and non thermal effect whereas extracorporeal shock wave only produces non thermal effect it has no heating effect it is are both modalities they employ sound waves to produce therapeutic effect and both use a coupling medium to transmit sound waves to the tissue now in both the cases we use a coupling medium because the sound waves uh, without using the coupling medium the sound may get waves may get reflected from the skin surface without proper penetration now in case of ultrasound sometimes instead of the coupling medium we can use some pharmacological compound like uh, uh, analgesic or antibiotic ointment uh, which is known as phonophoresis and which is not possible in case of extracorporeal shock wave therapy and both are very useful for heal healing and repair of the tissue injury with that i come to the end these are the references i have used thank you very much for your patience here okay thank you so much miss nita kabuluri Thank you, Thank you very much, ma'am, for your comprehensive and informative discussion. We learned a lot, the therapeutic modalities, the different therapeutic modalities applied in sports, no? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. The different stimulation, galvanic, transcutaneous, electrical nerve stimulation, the different therapies from um, IFT, the therapy, thermotherapy hot magnet therapy paraffin wax therapy ultrasound therapy laser therapy and also the extra corporeal shock wave therapy and its difference of course the indications and the in contraindications and also the therapeutic effects thank you so much and at this juncture um may we present the certificate of appreciation to our speaker let me read the citation International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with knowledge partner Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital present the certificate of appreciation to Ms. Nita Kavuluri for sharing her precious time and effort as resource speaker during the conduct of the International Conference on Sports Injury Prevention. with a the theme effective safe therapeutic treatment approaches in achieving optimal performances of athletes organized by the international association of physical education and sports in collaboration with physical education foundation of india with knowledge partner siri balaji medical college and hospital given this 10th day of july 2021 via zoom platform congratulations and thank you so much Miss Nita Kavaluri. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. I'm over well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So moving on for our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is a sports medicine specialist.
Sir, please unmute. Yeah. Okay. So our next speaker is the sports medicine specialist and doctor and founder and director of Kinesis Sports with his topic, the role of nutrition in sports injury rehabilitation. Let's all welcome Dr. Bharath Kumar B. Good day, Dr. Sir. Dr. Kumar, please. Hello. Sir. Hi, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Go yes, ahead, sir. sir. Thank you. Let's get started. All right, thank you all for the invite. And uh, today my uh, topic of discussion will be the role of nutrition in sports injury rehabilitation. The previous discussion uh, from Dr. Nita was exhaustive. And thank you so much for refreshing my memories as well. So I'm basically a sports medicine doctor. So I was with Sports Authority of India and Sports Authority of Karnataka previously as a consultant. Now, as of today, I practice sports medicine, exercise medicine, and nutritional medicine. So I have a keen interest in nutrition. So I chose nutrition and sports rehabilitation. Now, uh, when we talk about nutrition in sports injury rehabilitation, it seems like a very a uh, small part of what actually goes on. Now in sports injury rehabilitation, it is mainly the doctor who focuses, who does a diagnosis and the physiotherapist works hands-on with the athlete. Now that seems to be a huge chunk of work that is going on. But what we fail to understand is that whatever happens inside the body is as important uh, as we see outside. I mean, as in uh, the injury per se will heal even if there is no intervention, but there with some modifications. But we need to take care of the health and immunity and the wound healing process as a whole and prioritize it so that the athlete is back on the field as soon as possible. So the goals of nutrition um, during the rehabilitation would be definitely first priority is the promotion of wound healing. And since the athlete is not active, so there is every chance of uh, him or her uh, decreasing the muscle mass and losing the strength over a period of time and thereby accumulating fat because of wrong nutrition. And at the same time, it is definitely a base for uh, the doctor and the nutritionist to optimize the health of the athlete and reverse all the nutritional deficiencies which may have arised uh, due to previous wrong nutrition and also uh, to focus on preventing depression. Now, why I stress on preventing depression is most of the athletes are um, mentally very strong, but they are always on the field, but it is very, very, uh, I would say, sort of inhuman to restrict them to just the um, sports medicine center and their home or room, wherever they stay. So since they are very inactive physically, they feel very mentally down. So their mental health, uh, health is very um, important during this phase of rehabilitation. And of course, because of the physical um, inactivity, the sleep quality is also reduced and thereby the immunity is also affected. It is a combination of not able to play and uh, the fear of gaining weight and uh, mentally being low and not able to sleep better. 
so these are the nutrition goals and yeah but we do have few challenges now physiologically let us understand what the athlete is going through now the athlete is uh, um, not performing the activity so thereby there is a marginal decrease in the basal metabolic rate now we need to account this while uh, calculating the macros and micros to build a diet plan so there is a component of calculation called the physical activity level we need to taper it down to the appropriate value based on the type and the duration of the injury so since there is a sedentary behavior on the part of the athlete so there is a chance of uh, um, medical problems like uh, insulin resistance and mental health issues so these are the challenges that may arise in nutrition so during the course of our discussion we will focus on how to deal with the macros then we will briefly look at uh, the probiotics what is their role and what the micronutrients does what are important and we will uh, finally end the discussion with supplements and superfoods so uh, i'm not going into the details of uh, how to calculate uh, the energy expenditure because that is fairly simple uh, for all the listeners here so it is based on uh, the harrison benedict equation so wherein we get the basal metabolic rate and which uh, multiplied by the appropriate physical activity factor gives us a total energy expenditure and then we split the ratios uh, into whatever ratios uh, usually it is uh, 30 30 40 between the carbohydrates proteins and fats and that is how our diet plan is uh, made now so uh, since the athlete is now sedentary uh, obviously bmr is low and the physical activity level is less so the uh, total energy expenditure is decreases by about 50 percent now when the total energy expenditure decreases by about 50 percent uh, combined with a sedentary lifestyle now like i said before there is a tendency for the athlete to develop insulin resistance now if this insulin resistance or the sensitivity factor is very essential pardon me very essential because if there is no insulin response there is no anabolic effect which means that the muscles which not, will not get um, strong or built if there is a lack of insulin response but in case of an insulin resistance there is still insulin but the cell at the cellular level the body is unable to utilize it so to prevent or even treat or reverse if at all it is present earlier we follow um, the recent trend suggests a low carbohydrate approach now there is a reason for this low carbohydrate approach uh, because the goal of uh, every um, diet plan should be to push the athlete into something known as nutritional ketosis now i say this because now uh, for centuries together we have been um, thinking of glucose as the main uh, energy um, component but uh, in fact ketone bodies which arise from the fats are a better source of fuel which is a very very efficient source of fuel but uh, in order to um, metabolize the ketone bodies the body needs a lot of mitochondria which means that the fat burning machinery is virtually absent in the body Okay, the mitochondrial density is very very less in uh, people who consume a very high carbohydrate diet so yes uh, if we look at it from the outside carbohydrates seem to provide a majority of the uh, energy uh, that is uh, spent by the body but fats are definitely a better source of energy but since the body does not know to use utilize it okay so then we are at loss so uh, lowering the carbohydrates uh, promotes uh, the body to tap into the fat stores okay so thereby not only entering the, in a, the state called nutritional ketosis it also reverses or prevents the in, uh, development of insulin resistance now uh, 
since we've decided on the percentage of carbohydrates, um, now the next question would be what kind of carbohydrates will it be? Now, most of the energy intake uh, should be from the complex carbohydrates uh, because of the advantage of low glycemic index. Now, these can be from uh, starchy vegetables or the whole grains and uh, very less from the sugary intakes. So it is not uh, only important that we focus on the glycemic index, but also take care of the glycemic load and monitor the insulin response. If at all an athlete is diabetic, uh, different, uh, this uh, monitoring has to be much more intense and uh, we need to use a, a CGM device, which is a continuous glucose monitoring device uh, to see how his blood the sugar fluctuates in response to a particular diet. So the next would be uh, the most important protein. Now protein is definitely overused and abused at the athlete level, but uh, um, although it is the building blocks of life, the additional uh, component of protein would be that it prevents inflammation if it is taken from the uh, right sources. Now the dosage varies from athlete to athlete. Now it is anywhere between uh, 1.5 to 2.5 grams uh, per kg body weight per day. And uh, the maximum uh, absorption of protein uh, in, a, in one particular meal will be 45 grams. So if the uh, protein intake is more, let's say uh, the athlete is huge, weighs about 100 kgs or so, so it is very good to split the proteins into uh, different meals. And the protein not only helps in uh, preventing the muscle loss, but also helps the uh, athlete to remain full and provides a satiety factor. So this satiety factor is very important in uh, um, caloric control or hunger management, as we would say. So. Uh, in these days where people are turning uh, vegan and vegetarian, so there is always, it is always a debate to um, determine the sources of protein, but uh, on any given day, the animal source of protein is, uh, uh, is com uh, very much complete and has the uh, amino acids in the right proportions as compared to the plant sources of protein. So plant sources can never really replace an animal source, however well it is manufactured. So uh, coming to the fats, uh, yes, so as far as the balanced diet norms, the fat uh, content would be about 30% of the total uh, energy intake with saturated fats being 10%. So that is the old 1977 uh, uh, guidelines say, but then the recent guidelines uh, have focused on fat adaptation and uh, the athlete going into, uh, I mean, uh, developing a, uh, uh, improving his fat um, uh, metabolism. So now the fats not only add to the satiety intake by uh, releasing a hormone called leptin, now which is basically a satiety hormone. So it also provides uh, um, the much needed fat soluble vitamins and uh, it also promotes nutritional ketosis. Now, uh, what fats do we uh, prescribe? Now, again, we are in an era where vegetable oils have taken over the country and the, uh, definitely the world. Now, the vegetable oils are basically the safflower, sunflower oils, which are... Um, Poly uh, consisting of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now let's take logically. Now polyunsaturated fatty acids have a lot of uh, single bonds, uh, which can be broken down and uh, then uh, they can be modified. Uh, but and also then the boiling point and the smoking point of the PUFAs are very very less. So they are very bad oils actually to be used in cooking. So the shift uh, always is towards preferring a monounsaturated fatty acid oil, like an olive oil, or maybe uh, use of more of saturated fatty acids, uh, acids uh, like the animal fats, the ghee, and uh, 
nicoconate oil. So those are definitely better in terms of nutrient profile. So we'll we'll uh, come back uh, briefly to fats at a later stage when we talk about the omega six and the omega uh, ratio. So coming to probiotics, now probiotics are uh, you now this is saying that uh, uh, every disease starts in the gut. Now to maintain gut health, the um, bacteria that is present in the gut is very very important. Now due to unnecessary use of uh, things like antibiotics and the processed food and the vegetable oils and the modernization of the life uh, today so the gut health is uh, usually bad and there is a lot of malabsorption issues leading to um, mineral deficiencies and vitamin deficiencies so we are in a pandemic of not only covid but also we are in a pandemic of uh, where we are consuming an energy excess and at the same time we are malnourished. So obesity is one uh, such condition. So uh, what we need to consume is uh, the lactobacillus, uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium and uh, yeah, 10 power 10 uh, uh, colony CFUs per day is what is recommended. So it definitely improves gut health and which in turn uh, uh, improves the immune function of the athlete. Uh, coming back to the um, micronutrients, now this um, um, vitamin C is very important, especially for wound healing because vitamin C is uh, involved in collagen synthesis and it is a very potent antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory. So it not only boosts immunity, but also directly helps in wound healing. So uh, we are very fortunate that vitamin C is easily available and it is uh, found in a variety of citrus fruits and other vegetables like capsicum. And uh, so there is a saying again which says uh, store the vitamin C in gunny bags and eat in grams. So it's uh, for athletes usually supplement vitamin C which is definitely not necessary but they can get it from good sources. So the recommendation is one gram per day. So this is another pandemic that we are suffering because of the indoor lifestyle, hypovitaminosis D3. Now, vitamin D is a secosteroid hormone, which is respond, which is necessary for uh, proper functioning of every single cell in the body, virtually every single cell. So because of the indoor lifestyle and poor sun exposure and uh, a lot of sunscreens and a lot of clothing, uh, we are deficient in vitamin D. Okay, So that is not the only reason. Now, there are three things. One is uh, the less sun exposure. The second one is uh, definitely lack of uh, the vitamin D rich foods because of the vegetarianism and the veganism. And the third thing is definitely RO water. Now, uh, there is a study which uh, has been proven that uh, RO water leaches away all the minerals and the other vitamins, including uh, vitamin D3. So it is very shocking fact. So first thing that we need to change is our RO filters, or if you can reset it, reset it to a TDS. TDS is a total dissolved solids of about 300 to 400. Now the current uh, RO is usually at somewhere between 50 to 150, which means it is definitely demineralizing your bone. So set it to at least 400 for your own benefit. So now vitamin D3 is definitely responsible for uh, increased calcium absorption and the phosphate absorption at the gut level. And uh, it helps in um, uh, not only bone formation, but also adequate functioning of uh, the musculoskeletal system. So if at all we need to get the sun, how much do we get? Now, we need to get a minimum of 30 minutes of uh, sun exposure per day with uh, exposure of 40% body surface area. Now, when we say 40% body surface area, it, it is just uh, a shorts and a vest. So the rest of the body, whatever is exposed, uh, including the face, the arms, and the uh, legs, the below thigh is uh, constitutes about 40% body surface area. So we need about minimum 30 to 40, per, 40 minutes a day. 
So the more we use the sunscreen and the more we are covered up, the longer that we need to get the adequate uh, vitamin D3. And coming back to the fats, now these days, uh, as we discussed, there is a, a, a vegetable oil uh, pandemic going on. Now, the ideal ratio of uh, omega-6 to omega-3 is uh, about 5 is to 1. Now, uh, the current oils that we use, like let's say sunflower oil, is about 30 is to 1. So that promotes inflammation. Okay, so why it promotes inflammation is the omega-3 uh, fatty acids uh, get converted into anti-inflammatory mediators and omega-6 can get converted into pro-inflammatory mediators. Now, when the omega-6 is high, so there is a lot of inflammation. So what people usually do is they take omega-3 supplements, but at the cellular level, what happens is omega-6 and omega-3 compete for the same receptor. So even if you take more of omega-3 it is absolutely of no use the key here is to reduce the consumption of omega-6 and not increase the consumption of omega-3 because you are just adding uh, to excess energy in your body so that is the key omega-3 supplements are of literally no use if at all you do not uh, decrease the omega-6 level so now it is definitely available in um, uh, vegetarian sources like walnuts, chia, and flax seeds, and uh, fish is the major uh, component for omega-3. So coming to the micronutrients, zinc is one of the more uh, important in terms of uh, musculoskeletal health because it is a component of the metalloproteinase uh, enzyme, and uh, it promotes wound healing, and it is also uh, a component of immune function. Now, it is available mostly from the animal sources and few uh, from the whole grains. Now, whole grains again have something known as phytic acid, which chelates a lot of minerals. So, uh, I really doubt if the zinc component from the whole grains are really absorbed. So, animal sources are definitely better. Now, at the cellular level, uh, zinc competes with copper for. Uh, the receptors and if there is an excess of zinc there is a copper deficiency so monitoring copper levels and zinc levels okay are definitely important then coming to the supplements uh, creatine is one such uh, very safe and legal supplement now creatine is definitely a natural substance that is found in the uh, human skeletal muscle uh, now, creatine is, an, uh, is the one which provides, uh, gets converted to phosphocreatine and it provides the phosphate moiety for the ATP, which is the cellular energy um, currency. So, uh, when there is more of creatine, uh, there is uh, adequate uh, energy for the muscle to function. So, in a study which uh, uh, helped the athletes to ingest about 20 grams of creatine, which was divided into five grams into four doses. It prevented uh, the muscle loss of muscle uh, girth and the muscle strength in the uh, after 10 days of uh, supplementation. So in the first 10 days is when uh, in the first 10 days of uh, uh, physical inactivity, there is not much of muscle loss, but if the physical inactivity is much more than 10 days, that is when muscle loss and I mean atrophy happens. So the, this study was conducted during that phase, and um, there, there was a fifty percent reduction in the loss of muscle and strength. Right. So we come to the superfood. So the most important superfood these days is uh, called is the uh, is the Indian root, uh, which is I mean it's not an Indian uh, root though it's found in the Asia. In countries, um, it's called turmeric. The active uh, ingredient of turmeric is uh, uh, called as curcumin. Now, this curcumin is a potent anti inflammatory, it is a potent systemic anti inflammatory, and it is also an antioxidant. So, many say that it is also a fat burner as well. 
So in studies which have used a tablet form of curcumin, um, up to eight grams of uh, curcumin has been ingested for two to three months. And then there was very minimal side effects like headache and nausea, but otherwise there were no um, um, changes in the biomarkers. But however, uh, the turmeric uh, or the curcumin is a strong anticoagulant. So uh, athletes who are taking anticoagulants because of some factors, um, their PT INR has to be monitored. So the uh, others uh, which are necessary are uh, boron, magnesium, and silicon and vitamin K, which are uh, which are uh, very easily found. But one uh, thing, magnesium is very important, which may be again deficient because of the use of RO water. And right, so we come to the end of. Uh, the um, talk. So I will. These are certain uh, guidelines for diet construction. Now, the usual uh, method of uh, diet construction would involve uh, just calculation of the energy intake, and uh, there is, uh, let's say, the athlete. Uh, the total energy required by the athlete when he was active was four thousand, and then he becomes inactive, and then it comes down to two thousand two hundred. Now. There is a law. Uh, there is a decrement in 1800, and then if we take the ratios again, uh, the there is a decrement in the uh, sub, um, supplementation of the micros also by 50 percent almost. Okay, so that is not the way that we do it. Now the the goal of the diet construction has to be uh, uh, to achieve maximal nutrition in and minimize the energy as much as it is necessary just for achieving our nutrition goals. So, and also uh, it shouldn't be a switch, okay? It shouldn't be an on and off switch. It should definitely be a taper. Now we, we need to decrease it at 10% uh, uh, intervals uh, each, uh, maybe every three days or every week, okay? And uh, uh, one thing we need to importantly uh, maintain is that the physical activity factor uh, has to change for the calculation of the uh, total energy expenditure and low carbohydrate to promotional ketosis is very, very important. The fats are again to satiety. And also one more thing that we can uh, very easily do is uh, to shorten the eaten, uh, eating window of the athlete. Now, when we shorten the eating window of the athlete, so we are again helping the body to uh, get into nutritional ketosis by so this, this concept is called intermittent fasting it has been uh, widely researched and then it is still being researched today even in the athletes uh, so the key to uh, helping the athlete choose his own foods is uh, to monitor the protein energy ratio now let's say um, we take into example a cereal. This a cereal provides uh, a lot of energy but very minimal proteins. Whereas uh, shifting towards meat, uh, which provides a lot of uh, protein and a very minimal energy. So the higher is the protein to energy ratio, the better are the foods and they are rich in nutrition. So that is what will take us towards the performance. All right. I thank you so much for your patient listening. I can take questions for the next few minutes. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Bharat Kumar, sir, on your topic on the importance and the significant role of nutrition in sports injury rehabilitation. We've learned a lot, sir, from the nutrition goals, the challenges, the components, no? So at this juncture, uh, may I read the, we will present the certificate of appreciation to our speaker. Let me read the citation once again. International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with knowledge partners, Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Bharat Kumar B for sharing his precious time and effort as resource speaker during the conduct of the International Conference on Sports Injury Prevention with the theme, Effective 
safe therapeutic treatment approaches in achieving optimal performance of athletes. Organized by International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with college partner, Suri Belaji Medical College and Hospital. Given this 10th day of July, 2021 via Zoom platform. Congratulations, Dr. Bharat Kumar. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Moving on, uh, let's proceed to the next speaker, okay? The instructor and physiotherapy department of Isfahan University of Medical Sciences, Isfahan in Iran, to discuss on the topic, effect of TDCS on improving functions of athletes. Let's all welcome Dr. Hamsi Baharlui. Good afternoon, good day, sir. Please allow Kulkarni sir, he is waiting. Please allow Kulkarni sir. After that, allow him. First allow Kulkarni sir, then allow him. He is waiting to, uh, for the Some technical issue may be there. First allow Kulkarni sir. Okay, so let's move on to the next speaker for this afternoon's conference on sports injury rehabilitation. So a consultant on sports and exercise medicine specialist and also the Asian Football Confederation, the AFC Medical and Doping Control Officer to discuss on the topic prevention of sports injuries. Let's all welcome Dr. Kiran Kulkarni. Dr. Kiran, sir. Go ahead, Dr. Kiran, please. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Yeah, I'll just uh, open up my uh, presentation. Just a moment. Am I visible, sir? Yes, sir. You're audible. And uh, my presentation is also visible. Hello. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Your presentation is not uh, visible. Visible? Visible, sir. Your presentation is not visible as, as of this moment, sir. Not visible. 
Yes, sir. We cannot see any presentation as, as of this moment, sir. No? Is it visible now, sir? Not yet, sir. Just a moment, sir. Sakshi, Musabba, Dweba, Dweba. The Zoom meeting open again, sir. Under murder. Kida? Under murder. Under murder. After the murder. Sir, sir, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Sir, I'll rejoin again. Just uh... okay, sir. Um, sir. Versha, let's proceed first to uh, Dr. Hamze. Noted, sir. Noted. So, I'd like to to present this another speaker for this afternoon. Our speaker is Dr. Hamze Bahalui an instructor of psychotherapy department of Isfahan University of Medical Sciences, Isfahan, Iran, on the topic, effects of TDCS on improving functions of athletes. Dr. Hamsi, please. Can you hear me, doc Dr. Hamsi, please? Yes, Dr. Hamzi. Go ahead, sir, Dr. Hamzi, please.
Dr. Kiran, you can proceed, sir. Okay. Please uh, unmute uh, Kulkarni, sir. Please unmute Kulkarni, sir. He is ready to deliver his lecture. Dr. Kiran, sir. Sir, yeah. Yes. My, my slides are visible, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. We can see your slides now. Just now. Okay, thank you so much. Go ahead, sir. Uh, sorry for the technical uh, glitch. Uh, once again, good afternoon to everybody. So at the outset, I would be here to present on uh, sports injuries and uh, prevention. So first of all, I would like to thank all the dignitaries who have given me an opportunity to present myself in this uh, webinar. So it has been a common saying in today's world of sport that injuries are a part of game. And uh, we have to think or we have to say whether it is true. But uh, definitely research and studies have shown that 50 to 70% of all sports injuries can be prevented. And of course, it is needless to say that the sports physician, physiotherapists are the key players in this process, along with the coach and of course, the sports medicine team and with the whole paraphernalia of sports science subjects. So coming to the to know what is sports medicine team, we have again team A and team B. That is uh, team A is the injury management team and team B is the human performance team. So in uh, injury management team A, we have these uh, sports physicians, sports orthopedic surgeons, sports gynecologists, pediatricians, etc. And along with them, we have the sports physiotherapists, dentists, podiatrists, nurses, assistants and athletic trainers. and Team B would be along with the uh, massage therapist, exercise physiologist, sports biomechanist, orthotic specialist, biochemistry specialist, sports nutritionist, sports psychologist, coaches, strength and conditioning experts, and of course, the hydration experts also have entered this team. So just to know the... Uh, branches of sports medicine, we have these uh, uh, sports anthropometry, exercise uh, physiology, sports biotypology, sports medical assessment and medical uh, emergencies, sports orthopedics, pediatric sports, women and sports, sports nutrition. Just now Dr. Bharat spoke uh, very nicely on uh, sports nutrition. And uh, we have the sports pharmacology and uh, doping, biomechanics and kinesiology, training methods, sports physiotherapy, geriatric sports, disability sports, therapeutic sports, recovery sports medicine. And here, sports medicine and its branches are right from anatomy to obstetrics and gynecology and the whole set of sports science subjects. So coming to the injuries, so this person has built himself in a, on the gate and do we consider this as a sports injury is again a question mark. So just look at his uh, knee joint, which has uh, almost turned 180 degrees. Just uh, uh, keep on uh, viewing these uh, uh, simple slides, which show catastrophic uh, injuries, which have occurred on the field. And you can see here that Evander Holyfield's ear has been bit by Mike Tyson. Do we also consider this as a sports injury? So what is an injury? So basically it is a cellular damage and there is local network of 
blood vessels which are damaged and these damaged vessels start bleeding so there is cell death and injured soft tissue consists of dead cells extracellular substance and blood so we have these two types of uh, sports injuries that is uh, uh, macro trauma and other one is the micro trauma for macro trauma we also call it as a acute injury or a specific single episode of trauma with acute tissue disruption and micro trauma is chronic or overuse injury that results when an anatomic structure is exposed to low intensity repetitive cumulative force where the body's reparative efforts exceed are exceeded and local tissue breakdown occurs so this is a chronic injury so i have classified uh, another uh, type that is called as a intentional injuries where uh, probably uh, uh, mike tyson bit evander holyfield's ear probably it was because he was losing or intentionally he did that or again here you can see another two uh, uh, photographs where the eyes are gorged by the opponent players so another cl injury classification is again as we call it as the acute that is rapid onset sub acute injury is a period between acute and chronic usually lasts between 4 to 6 weeks post injury then another one is a chronic injury which is uh, lasting for more than 10 to 12 weeks post injury so we need to know what are the five signs of inflammation they are that heat redness pain swelling and when we have these four automatically there is the fifth movement is loss of movement because of all these above and one should be careful to report to the doctor as soon as we have all these things maximum you can wait for about 24 hours but even beyond 24 hours if these things persist then we need to report to the medical room so these are the common injury forms both acute and chronic like we have this musculoskeletal as well as the non musculoskeletal that is in musculoskeletal where the bone tendon muscles cartilage joint capsules nerve ligaments are all involved as well as non musculoskeletal are overtraining syndrome and the female athletic triad so these are non musculoskeletal uh, conditions so you, very important thing again is about the injury diagnosis so as soon as the patient reports to you with his injury we need to talk to him and we need to ask him how is how this injury happened and what was the mechanism of the uh, injury and we need to observe then we need to palpate or touch and check and also along with that whether the injury is painful in active movements or passive movements and beyond this we also need to perform skill tests in an athlete so this is an uh, acute injury so fracture types acute injury so again acute injury different types of fractures we see so coming to the acute injuries now so these acute injuries occur when there is sudden stress on the body what might be the three main causes so most uh, uh, common cause is collision with an opponent or an obstacle then second one is being stuck by an object like a cricket ball or a Uh, by uh, by the hand or elbow or a, or a knee of a opponent player and the third one would be falling from a height or at a speed so these are you know like the three main causes of acute injury so coming to the prevention of these acute injuries we have these uh, uh, pre season physical fitness proper warm up and walk down safe playing conditions avoid extremes of temperature proper equipments rules regulations and punishment and of course protective devices which are very important so now let us see each one of these properties and uh, see what best can be done to prevent injuries so physical fitness that we have on the, again two parts that is one is a general physical fitness and second one is a uh, specific physical conditioning programs along with that we have this basic physical fitness that is strength endurance flexibility speed and coordination these are the motor abilities and of course so we have another two types that is most important uh, like most important is the sports related physical fitness because when we are talking about uh, 
uh, injuries and prevention is uh, in the sporting field we always have to look into this sports related physical fitness here we have two types one is the health related physical fitness and second one is the skill related physical fitness so in health related physical fitness we have these five parameters where we check in the cardio respiratory endurance the muscular strength muscular endurance body composition and flexibility and in skill related uh, uh, physical fitness components we have these six uh, parameters where we have this speed power agility balance reaction time and coordination so this is one of the most important uh, uh, aspects in prevention of injuries then again coming to the warm up and warm down most of the time injuries happen because of lack of warming up as soon as uh, the uh, like especially in badminton uh, or a volleyball or a basketball even without warming up people start the athletes start uh, playing as soon as they find the court they join the team and they start playing but this should not be done warming up should be done because it is like proper warm up and warm down are a part of the game so warming up prepares the athlete psychologically it increases the body temperature it increases the heart rate and breathing of course with uh, these increases range of movements of the joints there is increased flexibility of the muscles and of course a little bit of uh, lactic acid of the previous days is also removed along with proper warm up and minimum of about uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes should be spent in general warm up and around 5 to 10 minutes should be spent on sports specific warming up and of course warming down also or limbering down or pulling down also is very important because once all these parameters are raised during the training uh, uh, during training or competition these protocols have to be again brought down to the base level so in this warming down proper uh, warm down about 50 to 60% of uh, lactic acid is removed and the heart rate the body temperature also and breathing rate also everything comes down to base root levels so again space uh, safe playing conditions are equally important ground markings play fields free of potholes stones thorns uh, should be looked into water facilities proper drinking water facilities to be provided for players as well as for spectators shades for players as well as for spectators should be provided in hot conditions temperature extremities again uh, is an important factor in prevention of injuries here we look into both hyperthermia as well as uh, uh, hypothermia so when there is uh, that is a very reason why most of the long distance uh, events uh, start very early in the morning in between 6 to 6:30 am uh, this is because of uh, uh, that the sporting activities should not take place in hot temperatures so heat exhaustion and heat stroke are medical emergencies and are to be looked into and again when we are having this uh, winter games again we need to look into the aspects proper dress and athletic gear are to be worn during training and competition so proper equipments and the equipments that are used in daily practice training and competition are to be checked for wear and tear oiling and greasing and if these equipments are damaged have to be promptly replaced mats and floorings to be cleaned of blood sweat and dust so we need again to be very careful in managing these equipments rules regulations and punishments of the game or sport are to be known by an athlete and his coach and it is mandatory i cannot say to the referee that uh, this uh, i did not know so penalty punishment and sanctions are necessary for unfair and foul play so mike tyson bit evander's uh, ear and he was uh, sanctioned for 2 uh, years his license was cancelled and it is a penalty and punishment and again the yellow cards and red cards are shown in the field of play it is to inform the player and the remaining 11 players and of course the other 11 players on the opposite side to say that play the game following the rules and regulations otherwise you will be shown a yellow card or a red card and you will be sent out 
so there has to be no compromise even on the part of the referees that rules and regulations of the game have always to be maintained safety equipments and devices these protective equipments are to be worn at all times helmets mouth guards chest and abdomen pads groin guards hand gloves thighs and leg pads shin pads and proper footwear have always to be worn during the game now coming to prevention of chronic injuries again we have you know two types one is the intrinsic and one is the extrinsic intrinsic is inside the body and extrinsic uh, factors are outside the body so coming to the intrinsic causes inside the body we have the history of previous injury poor conditioning and muscle imbalance in an athlete anatomical abnormalities nutritional factors and growth factors these are the intrinsic causes so history of uh, previous injury is the most reliable predictor of injury so proper rehabilitation is necessary for return to play time has always been a constraint to the athlete to the coach and the treating doctor and the physio so this has to be informed well in advance to the athlete so that proper uh, spacing and proper uh, rehabilitation techniques are followed and the athlete has to be sent to the ground injury free so unfit athletes are more likely to get injured and off season training program is necessary time is a constraint as i already told you who are treating these athletes so what about a muscle imbalance most common in athletes and a difference in 10% may cause injury so always we need to check between the agonist and the antagonist muscle so the consequences are initially there is stress to the underlying tissue once there is stress it pulls the parts of anatomy out of alignment and later on it interferes with foot strike and this leads to injuries of the lower limbs so coming to the abnormal uh, anatomical abnormalities in day to day activities they do not cause any problems but overuse injuries may occur when these areas are stressed repeatedly so for example anatomical abnormalities like flat foot high arched foot knock knees bow legs unequal leg length are to be identified so it is very important uh, for the coaches the sport science uh, faculty uh, to look into the talent identification process itself so during talent identification we always need to put in the right faith and figures and see that these athletes are ruled out who have this anatomical abnormalities so even if we these athletes have these problems if they come into sport and up to certain level they may improve their performance but up, later on once the load start increases beyond the district level beyond the state level and once they come to the national circuit and it will be very tough and they will land up with uh, injuries and imagine the amount of time which has been put on these athletes they cannot perform beyond this so it is very important to put forth uh, proper uh, uh, rules during the talent identification then nutritional factors where i'll not speak much because already the previous uh, speaker has put in enough uh, on this but still a female athletic triad is very important it is an athletic triad seen in female athletes where we have three problems that is a triangle like one we have the eating disorder in these athletes once the eating disorder starts automatically they land up with uh, menstrual uh, irregularities once eating disorder and menstrual irregularities start to set in automatically these female athletes will land up with bone problems and most common is the stress fracture so the triangle or the triad of eating disorder menstrual irregularities and stress fracture is called as a female athletic triad and that is the reason we need to have a good and sufficient sound knowledge of a balanced diet and nutritional supplements but we always need to avoid uh, tea coffee uh, soft drinks alcohol and smoking so coming to the growth factors 
so children are more susceptible than adults because of the reasons of presence of growth fertilis and the growth itself so basically these children if we don't look into the training uh, uh, procedure and the training load given on these children they may land up with oscoot scatters severs injury or the epiphyseal fractures itself so during training the coaches and the trainers have to give proper uh, time and spacing for this training protocols in young children so uh, one uh, this thing is you know like it is unique unique to uh, growing athletes so there is always a imbalance between the muscles and tendons during periods of rapid growth there is increased susceptibility to repetitive microtrauma and of course i said the manifestation would be the apophysitis of the tbl tubercle or we usually called as we call it as oscoot scatters disease and again the heel pain in young athletes is called as a severs disease so what about the extensive causes now so again we have to look into the training errors inappropriate training structure itself and improper footwear so in training errors too much too soon when there is sudden increase in time frequency intensity and duration we call it as a fit principle fitt so frequency intensity time and duration so these are to be included and proper training errors are to be corrected and uh, there are certain sports imposed uh, deficiencies like repetitive eccentric overload may definitely co uh, cause injuries uh, either to the low back or to the shoulder complex or to the elbow or even to the wrist joint so what about the improper workout structure one of the most common reasons athlete gets injured is because they do not prepare their bodies with a structured workout that is we need to follow the scientific training protocols the micro meso and macro cycles of training relaxation techniques off season pre competitive and competition competitive season workouts are very important so coming to the improper uh, footwear we need to invest <coughs> sorry we need to instead uh, invest on proper training shoes so these shoes should be soft flexible with a cushioned heel cup and proper arch support cushion tongue toe box <coughs> and those athlete those footwear that fit your foot so i always say that footwear are the uh, athletes most important item so how to buy an uh, athletic shoe so these are few of the uh, points we need to follow when we buy a uh, proper or uh, athletic shoe so this is the anatomy so the running shoe replacement so excessively worn running shoes may lead to injuries replace shoes every 400 to 600 miles or about uh, or about 6 uh, to 7 months we need to replace the shoes so in most cases the mid soles will wear out long before the out soles especially for heavy runners heavy runners should uh, you know like uh, always uh, look into their shoes and uh, so we call about 800 to 1200 kilometers or 6 to 8 months it always depends on how much mileage and intensity of the training so running shoes may lo lose between 30 to 50% of their shock absorption after about 800 to uh 1200 kilometers of the use it is always better to alternate between two pairs of running shoes and that will definitely extend the life of shoes so this was uh, when i was uh, the team doctor uh, for the national football team during uh, asian cup football so coming to uh, the controversies in exercise so uh, there are always two schools of thought one would always say that you do these things and the other school will say don't do these things so i belong to the other where uh, we actually need to look into are we going to do these exercises like are we going to do the neck rotation are we or should we do trunk rotation should we do knee rotation ankle rotation wrist rotation and uh, 
the athlete who is doing this hurdle stretch it is a right way of doing hurdle stretch so usually what we do is we externally rotate the hip joint and uh, externally rotate the knee joint also and do a hurdle stretch but that is a wrong but if you see in this uh, uh, slide the lady who is doing a hurdle stretch sitting and doing a hurdle stretch is a right way of performing exercise but every day morning and evening when we are into the gym or in we see these recreational athletes or uh, people who go and perform this uh, uh, yoga or uh, zumba or any of these uh, uh, aerobic activities they always perform neck rotations trunk rotations knee rotations so i belong to that school where these rotations should not be done because we all should have a sound knowledge of types of joints and the movements so rotational movements are usually done in a ball and socket type of joint that is a shoulder and a hip joint flexion and extension movements are to be done in a hinge joint like elbow and knee joint and neck joint is a pure joint where we the the movements at the neck joint are forward flexion extension then uh, left uh, uh, deviation right deviation left tilt and right tilt these are the only six movements which happen at the pure joint that is a neck joint again we have the saddle and gliding and and uh, general movements like adduction abduction flexion extension internal external rotation circumduction they are all standard movements but each joint has to be looked into and we need to have a sound knowledge of these types of movements so these are the general movements so always look into uh, the movement of the joint when you are prescribing or when you are doing this movement and uh, other very important uh, factor is we all need to know about the risk factors that is whether the athlete has a history of smoking and alcoholism whether he is obese what about the family history of long term diseases whether the athlete has chest pain whether he has shortness of breath whether he has palpitations palpitations means hearing of one's own heart beats is called palpitations then uh, whether he had blood clot, uh, clots infections fever unexplained weight loss uh, sores that won't heal swelling of joints whether he had any eye injury or eye surgery hernias hip surgeries these are all risk factors and it is always better we as a uh, 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 like you know doctors or sports science uh, uh, specialists physios we need to know this coaches we need to know of these risk factors then coming to the injury management pyramid so we always need to make the accurate patho anatomical diagnosis then we have to control inflammation we have to promote healing we need to advise uh, exercises we need to control abuse and of course finally it is uh, prompt activity participation so what about controlling inflammation so you can always uh, 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 remember this uh, mnemonic prismar so we all know about ice or rest rest that is rest ice we can always add this prismar that is always use a give protection and prevent these injuries so rest relative rest ice compression elevation then uh, m is for uh, medications m for modalities and r for rehabilitation never forget to contact your doctor if there is any problem so soft tissue injuries need peace and love so what is peace peace is protection elevation avoid uh, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs that is we call them as anesthetics or uh, painkillers compression to the joint and we need to educate the athlete and of course nutrition nutrients are required and uh, load has to be managed so optimum training protocol has to be followed vascularization of the injury and exercises so always remember peace and love and uh, no harm h a r m so never do this never give heat ferment or hot ferment to the uh, injured uh, area no alcohol consumption avoid running and uh, massage is contraindicated so do not do this when you are injured so finally stay away from doping drugs so this was during the 
Indian uh, Premier League cricket that no athlete is spared and they all need to repair, report to the doping control room. Here you see the doping control officer along with his chaperons and the high profile athlete who is at the doping control station. So this is a, a, a poster which has been approved by World Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, you uh, people can all download this uh, uh, poster. You can always uh, present this uh, poster because uh, this poster indicates the deleterious effects of uh, uh, anabolic steroids. As steroid intake leads to soft tissue injuries, so that is the reason why you, we always have to say no to drugs. So this uh, poster you always you can uh, download and you can uh, put it in your uh, notice boards so that the athletes and other people can uh, definitely view this uh, poster and let them come to know about the bad effects of steroids and why steroids have been completely banned in sports. So anyway, we all need to be prepared because we do not know when injuries will strike. And uh, that is uh, one of the most important uh, factors that we have to prevent injuries. So this uh, young boy is already ready, ready to go into the uh, sporting uh, field. And as we always say that prevention is better than cure. So coming to the conclusion or the take home uh, message is a major obstacle to developing strategies for preventing injuries is lack of epidemiological data on injury rates in most of the sports. So that's the reason we need to be ready. So this is uh, one of the uh, posters. I just got uh, it from uh, the past president, Antonio Samaranchi. I has said that sports is friendship. It is health. Sports is uh, uh, education. It is a way of life. Sports bring the world together. See, as in this very uh, uh, webinar, we have uh, so many organizations internationally where so many countries have joined hands in spreading the knowledge of uh, uh, prevention of sports injuries and other uh, various uh, very important uh, topics. So sports is definitely friendship and it brings the world together. So thank you. Thank you very much for uh, patient listening. And if there are any uh, uh, questions I have to answer, I am ready and uh, uh, it is the forum is open for questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you so much. Dr. Kiran Kulkarni for sharing your very clear, enlightening, and informative talk session. Namaste, Dr. Kiran Kulkarni, sir. Namaste, sir. So at this juncture, may we present the certificate of appreciation to our speaker, uh, okay, so yes, let me read the citation. International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with knowledge partner Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Kiran Kulkarni for sharing his precious time and effort as resource speaker during the conduct of the International Conference on Sports Injury Prevention with the theme, Effective, Safe, Therapeutic Treatment, Approaches in Achieving Optimal Performance of Athletes, organized by the International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with knowledge partner Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital given this 10th day of July, 2021 via Zoom platform. Congratulations, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Kulkarni. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank you very much, okay, sir Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And now for our next speaker, the instructor of physiotherapy department of Isfahan University in his topic, effect of TDCS on improving functions of athletes Let's all welcome Dr. Hamze Bahar Louis. Good day, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, do you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Oh,
Thank you very much. And uh, did you receive the uh, PPT file from me or not? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm so sorry for technical problems and I hope I can finish uh, my presentation uh, good. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, executive uh, team um, for their kind try. Um, okay, uh, my the title of my presentation is the effect of TDCS on improving function in at least. Uh, the first slide, please. Next slide. Okay. In the 21st century, new training techniques inspired by advances in the neurosciences have been developed. Among them, the use of non-invasive brain stimulation initially developed for clinical purposes has expanded to the field of sport performance. The most common technique is called transcranial direct current stimulation, which is abbreviated TDCS. TDCS has recently attracted considerable scientific interest due to its ability to modulate brain functioning. From a historical perspective, ancient Greek philosopher Plato and Osrisol were both aware of the torpedo fish electrical discharges capacity to elicit therapeutic effect. The use of a live torpedo fish on the skull to cure headache might indeed be classified as an early form of TDCS. This practice consists in applying a direct current in transcranial way as constructed with intracranial way as with a putative brain activity modulation effect. The fish electrical stimulation was used for the treatment of epilepsy, headache, and even gout for over 10 centuries. And next slide, please. Currently, TDCS devices apply a weak direct current uh, stimulation uh, most of the time between 0 0.5 to 2 milliampere, typically powered by a 9 volt battery, 0 to or more electrodes placed on the scalp. Typically for several minutes, uh, most of the time, 10 to 30 minutes, to facilitate or inhibit a spontaneous neural activity. It had been applicated that the identity of this modulation is solely dependent on the stimulation polarity. It is now known that anodal stimulation is capable of increasing excitability, I mean the activity of the brain, which is resulted in response to cathodal stimulation. A possible mechanism underlying TDCS effects might be, might be associated with alternation in cortical neuronal activity. Although TDCS stimulates the cortical region directly under the electrode, it could be also modulate subcortical structures since there are connections between the cortical areas. We called it cortico-cortical neural connectivity matrices. This method is capable of alternation in action potential threshold. Uh, next slide, please. The exact mechanism underlying the stimulation has not been clarified in detail yet. Previous studies have shown that TDCS can promote the inhibition of GABA, uh, which is known as an inhibitory neurotransmitter and uh, enhance dopamine serum levels and increase BDNF. BDN BDNF is so important for us because it uh, includes the nerve growth factors and also it is not only involved in the process that regulate neurobiology but also in central and peripheral energy metabolism. Particularly, BDNF 
plays an essential role in the regulation of metabolism in the skeletal muscle, such as fat oxidation and glucose metabolism. And next slide, please. This technique was originally developed as a diagnostic tool in neurosciences research to induce transient and control change in the activity of a specific brain region or network. Its application was initially limited to a study of the role of cerebral or subcerebral structures in a specific motor, cognitive, or perceptual process. Later on, TDCS has been studied also to explore its utility in the treatment of various neurological disorders, pathologies, or syndromes. TDS has been used in neuropsychiatric and neurological disorders, modulation of autonomic nervous system, appetite, energy expenditure, motor performance, and motor learning. It was approved or presently under approved by FDA for the treatment of various neurological or and psychiatric disorders, including depression, Parkinson's disease, pain, uh, and uh, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and also for improvement of overall mental and a state of uh, concentration. And next slide, please. These are the advantages of uh, TDCS and the reasons that uh, make it a popular uh, intervention in rehabilitation. TDCS is safe. It is non-invasive treatment. It is a low-cost treatment, pain-free, and easy to implication. Next slide, please. Okay, let me speak about the motor control. Uh, motor control refers to the process of achieving a desired coordinated movement by the nervous system structure. Motor cortex projections to motor circuit within the spinal cord are closely linked to muscle control. Motor learning depends on the motor cortex to learn new movement anticipate or adjust the desired action. Next slide, please. There is two fundamental question about the effect of TDCS and its application in the sport rehabilitation. The fundamental question arises as to how TDCS modulate neural polarization. The low current up to two milliamp through non-invasive electrodes on the scalp, modulate the neural excitability accordingly with electrode polarity. In general, it's assumed that anodal stimulation current enters the tissue inducing excitatory effect and the cathodal stimulation current exit the tissue inducing inhibitory effect. Whereas TDCS biophysics effect modulate neural membrane polarization, a second question then arises whether TDCS benefit motor learning on rehabilitation and sport performance. Uh, next slide, please. I am going to review the main effect of uh, TDCS on motor function. TDCS appears to be effective to modulate motor learning in both health and disease condition and also in professional athletes. Several studies have reported anodal M1 stimulation related to behavior improvement, such as executive function and drawing performance, self perception in spite of improving learning and motor performance, TDCS also has been a boost effect when it reduces fatigue perception. It has been reported that TDCS could improve behavioral performance in a diverse array of cognitive domains. Balance, reaction time, 
motor skill acquisition, fatigue perception, and strength. These elements are considered as markers of athlete performance. Moreover, it is also that TDCS technique may support stress management through physiological control of autonomic system, which could potentially result in performance gains in many sport activities. Next slide, please. Brain doping is an interesting uh, area of research uh, for someone who wants to make a link between neuromodulation and sport rehabilitation. Apart from its diagnostic and therapeutic utility, TDCS can also represent a potential form of electromagnetic doping, brain doping, and innovative concept in the field of performance enhancing methods in sport. Since term neurodoping was introduced, the use of TDCS has gained popularity in sports science within a short space of time based on the same straightforward logic. If exercise, if exercise is to some extent determined by, by brain activity, then stimulation brain areas related to exercise should improve physical and sport performance. In a recent review, it is suggested that TDCS might have a positive effect on exercise capacity, although the mechanism of that potential benefit were unknown. <clears throat> However, the list of substances and methods banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, does not include this kind of practice as well as other putative forms of technological doping whose regulation is presently still evolving. In this context, TDC assets at the interface between classic pharmacological doping and technological forms of doping. More in detail, brain doping consists in attempt of boosting the sport performance using technologies that may induce a change set of brain activities through the application of weak direct current that flows between two electrodes on the scalp. Next slide, please. These stimuli can induce a series of effects that can positively impact on sport performance. They include enhancement in muscle strength, attenuation of sense of fatigue, reduction of recovery time, and positive change on mental state and concentration. In particular, anodal stimulation in which the anode is over the motor cortex seems to increase sport performances compared to both cathodal stimulation and no stimulation condition. It means sham stimulation condition. Because the excitability of the motor cortex decreases fatigue-related muscle pain and increases motor and perceptual learning, motivation, and power. Another study determined the effect of anodal TDCS in improving cycling performance, monitoring the increase in time to exhaustion in athletes. Uh, next slide, please. Athletes are regularly expected to do complicated sporting skills in social, evaluative, and challenging environments. Competitive sports demand from athletes to perform appropriately under intense conditions, not only in the physical, but also psychological context. However, real-world competition is typically carried out under social stressors that are capable of provoking psychological and physio physiological responses 
that can be classified into various copying strategies under competition. The subjective evaluation and appraisal of athletes' ability to cope with stressors of competition affect the development of negative emotional stress and anxiety. Anxiety has been explained as an emotional state which is characterized by restlessness, worried thoughts, and physiological arousal. According to multidimensional competitive anxiety models, anxiety symptoms can be cognitive, for example, negative thought, irritability, fear, feeling of weakness, and poor concentration, somatic, like increase in blood pressure and heart rate, sweating and muscle tension, and also behavioral, for example, repetitive movement and aggressive outbursts. Competitive anxiety and self-confidence are especially important in the context of sport and might be a determining factor in the final outcome of a sport competition. And it has been reported in the literature. Prior to a stressful event, such as world class competition, subcortical areas like uh, hypothalamus and brain stem trigger a strong and uh, almost unspecific neuroendocrine responses like uh, cortisol. Cortisol helps in the regulation of stress response. Some investigation have recently indicated that increased stress biomarkers to a reduction in the overall performance of athletes. Therefore, interventions that can reduce psychophysiological response of stress and anxiety are proposed to enhance athletic performance. Next slide, please. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the area in the brain, in the frontal area, is associated with a broad spectrum of cognitive function from emotional behavior to regulation of mood and anxiety. In fact, one of the essential roles of DLPFC is processing and regulating emotional processes. The effect of TDCS on the DLPFC has been addressed in various areas across a range of patient population and psychiatry conditions with promising results. Cognitive and fine motor skills would more be affected after DLPFC stimulations, while maximal force or vertical jump would be more likely in influenced by TDCS applied over uh, motor cortex. Looking into result of mood state, anodal TDCS over the DLPFC could reduce tension and fatigue and enhance the vigor when the, these parameters were compared with catadol or sham condition. Ne next slide, please. Uh, this is an, a study about the effect of uh, TDCS applying on DLPFC uh, and uh, introduced TDCS as a recovery strategy. In this study, TDCS was applied in the days after official match targeting the DLPFC. It, this study showed that ATDCS or the DLPFC may have a positive effect on enhancing well-being and parasympathetic autonomic markers. And this study opens up a possibility for testing TDCS as a promising recovery enhancing strategy targeting in the brain in soccer players. Uh, next study, next slide, please. Okay, these are the list of uh, areas that we can use TDCS for uh, doping. Uh, 
increase of attention span, enhancement of memory and improvement of cognitive ability, improvement of sport performance through the motor learning, enhancement of muscular strength, attenuation of fatigue, increase of endurance time and reduction of recovery time, and induction of change on mental state and concentration. These are uh, areas that we can uh, suggest TDCS in uh, sport rehabilitation to improve the performance of athletes. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the area of the the area of the brain that their stimulation can make uh, some significant change in the performance of uh, athletes. If we put TDCS, if we apply TDCS on primary motor cortex, we can see increased M1 excitability to a speed neural drive to active muscle and also modulate pain perception. If we stimulate prefrontal cortex, we can see change in pacing behavior via executive function, for example, by increasing inhibitory control capacity. And uh, for temporal cortex, we can see autonomic cardiac control change in self-perception and awareness of the body sensation. And uh, if we uh, simulate supplementary motor area, it can reduce perceived exertion during exercise. Uh, next uh, slide, please. This is a device, a headset <clears throat> that introduced by San Francisco company in uh, USA. More recently, the effect of Halo Sport device, a commercial TDCS system consisting of a headset manufactured by Halo Neuroscience in San Francisco, USA, were tested. In fact, companies like Halo Sport claim that their do-it-yourself TDCS device has ergogenic effect and uh, in ergogenic effects and can increase sport and exercise performance. Its use was reported to improve repeated sprint cycling power output. For example, 20 minutes of treatment at two milliamp enhance the mean power output in cycling sprints and do have also positive effect on various aspects of cognitive function. Positive effect of Halo Sport device were also reported on the athletes of performance of ski jumpers. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, let me uh, also speak about the, some adverse effects of the TDCS. Reported adverse effects are generally mild and reversible and most of them are disappear soon after stimulation. Recently, it has been shown that TDCS did not induce major effect on peripheral metabolites. The most common persistent events consist of a skin lesion similar to burns, which can arise even in healthy subjects, and mania or hypomania, mostly in patients with depression. The combination of positive effects on the sport performance and the virtual absence of severe side effect make it a technique particularly appealing to attract athletes, especially since the application of TDCS is presently not prohibited. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to review some recent studies uh, to show some example of using TDCS in some sports and also in some uh, situation. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis in uh, 2019 uh, that uh, target and review studies using a single session of anadol TDCS on athletic performances. 
This study showed small improvements in maximal voluntary contraction and moderate effect on time to task failure performance. This study uh, suggests unadult TDCS over the M1 motor cortex area uh, and they use it for more than 10 minutes. It suggested 15 to 20 minutes of intervention. And also it showed that uh, anodal TDCS should be used uh, in combination with full body exercise like cycling. Next study, please. Next slide, please. Uh, in another study in 2020, TDCS uh, could uh, reduce motor fatigue ability during fast repetitive uh, movement. Uh, next slide. Uh, in basketball players, uh, TDCS on motor cortex could alleviate the speed decline during sprinting, decrease fatigue, increase counter movement jump height, and it has no influence on heart rate or rating of perceived exertion. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, study was about parkour. You know, it's, uh, it's, in an, it's an, a sport with some uh, special characteristic, like uh, parkour consists of jumping over various obstacles, has been recognized as one of the most popular type of sport activity. At least practicing parkour present a, a specific neuromuscular profile that could make them particularly prone to responding to TDCS intervention. It should be noticed that PAR could at least to have to manage a certain accuracy of their performance due to environmental constraints. Performance in parkour is then not only related to the capacity of neuromuscular system to produce the highest power as possible. TDCS applied over M1 uh, could enhance participants' uh, jump performance. Next slide, please. And it, it is about handball. In um, handball, TDCS could uh, induce a maximal voluntary isometric contraction temporary and progressive in uh, shoulder rotator muscles. We know that the imbalance in uh, external and internal rotator muscles is observed in handball players and also in volleyball players. Uh, and this uh, situation could result in uh, shoulder injury. Next slide, please. Uh, the last slide is about uh, a large cyclist. Bilateral TDCS on DLPFC, it means that we stimulate uh, DLPFC in right and left side uh, uh, simultaneously, improve cycling time trial performance without altering the physiological and perceptual response at moderate intensity. This uh, result indicate that an upregulation of prefrontal uh, cortex could enhance endurance exercise performance. Uh, last slide, please. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please accept my deep apologize for a uh, technical problem and my deep appreciation for the kind support of uh, executive team. Uh, this picture is from the beautiful, uh, beautiful Isfahan, Naqsh Jahan Square, and I am ready if you have any uh, question. Okay. Thank you so much, okay. Dr. Hamze, for enlightening us and giving us insights on the TDCS and DLPFC, the transcranial direct current stimulation and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and its 
effect on improving functions of athletes? You've mentioned about the different sports activities. So at this juncture, may we present the Certificate of Appreciation. Let me read the citation. International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with Physical Education Foundation of India with Knowledge Partner Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital present the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Hamse Baharlui for sharing his precious time and effort as resource speaker during the conduct of the International Conference on Sports Injury Prevention with a theme, Effective, Safe Therapeutic Treatment, Approaches in Achieving Optimal Performance of Athletes. Organized by the International Association of Physical Education and Sports in collaboration with the Physical Education Foundation of India with knowledge partner Siri Balaji Medical College and Hospital. Given this 10th day of July 2021 via Zoom platform. Thank you so much and congratulations, Dr. Hamsi Baharlui, sir. Thank you so much. Have a good time. Okay, thank you. So at this juncture, for the concluding session, let's move on to the open forum. So may I request um, our facilitator for the open forum. May I call on the, the college instructor of Katanduan State University. Let's all welcome Sir Mark Anthony Ard Dalipe. Sir. Sir Mark, please. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank Am you, I sir. audible, sir? Yes. Loud and clear, sir. Okay. So. Go ahead, sir. Oh, yes, sir. So good afternoon, everyone, and to our guests and dear highly specialized speakers, our organizers, and all the participants across the country. So, and to our dear speakers, thank you very much for this very informative and excellent presentation. And our participants are sending their warm and heartfelt thanks for your discussions. They are actually asking uh, sir and ma'am for the copy of, of, of your presentations in order for them to share this to their students. And indeed, sports injury rehabilitation is a safe therapeutic approach that helps athletes effectively treat pain and achieve optimal performance. And because rehabilitation is a way to regain our flexibility, strength, power, and endurance after a sports injury. So our afternoon became or becomes fruitful and meaningful because of the different speakers who shares their times just to give us these excellent presentations about the sports injury management, effect of DDCs on improving functions of athletes, the role of nutrition in sports injury rehabilitation, prevention of sports injuries, and different therapeutic modalities applied in sports. And good afternoon also to our uh, workaholic president of IEPS, Dr. Jewelson Santos. Of course, to Dr. Piyush, Associate Professor Dr. Kishore, Dr. Johnson, and Dr. Professor Darwin, Professor Atindra, Dr. Murthy, and of course to our uh, speakers, uh, Ms. Shirin Rai, Dr. Hamze Baharlui, Dr. Bharat Kumar, um, Ms. Nita Kavoluri, and Dr. Kiran Kolkarni. And of course, uh, we have Dr. TJ Panganiban and uh, Professor Faisal Fayez, and of course, our moderator, Mr. Jahasan Versha. And uh, let's proceed to our open forum this afternoon. And um, may we call on our uh, dear speaker, Ms. Shirin Rai, uh, who discussed about the sports injury management, because uh, there is a question here, ma'am, for you. Our participant is Ms. Shirin. Hello, yes, here, ma'am. Ma yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear yes, ma'am. There is a question for you, ma'am. Here, um, yes. can you explain, ma'am, about the RTP test? 
okay uh, rtp test is the full form is return to play return to play means uh, we have to decide whether uh, an injured uh, player when uh, and how is he going to return back to sports so an injured player uh, will not all of a sudden return to sport so for that we need to first uh, make him uh, go through the proper healing process and we need to give him proper rehabilitation proper rehab exercises and after a period of time when uh, the athlete has uh, gained uh, strength and proper uh, rehabilitation and uh, uh, he is able to move his limbs properly he is strong enough uh, then we need to assess him assess him properly by doing R various rtp tests rtp test uh, rtp test will be your return to play test return to play test are several tests we perform we perform strength test then we perform balance and coordination test we perform uh, hop uh, single leg hop test uh, double leg hop test crossover test then uh, we do all the skill test okay all these tests are done and we assess the, if the player is able to return back to sport if the player is able to perform all these uh, tests properly he passes the test then we uh, give a check mark that the player is uh can return to sport so this is your uh, return to sport okay thank you so much um miss shireen for that and i hope our participant um uh got get the art got his questions or your answer ma'am thank you so much ma'am and uh, um if you still remember to our participants, um, Ms. Shireen discusses or shows us the sports injury management. So thank you so much for that, ma'am. That was a very informative discussion, ma'am. So do no harm, peace, and love. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, of course, let's call, or may we call on Ms. Nita Kavoluri. Ma'am, are you there? Or are you still there, ma'am? who discusses or who discuss to us about the different therapeutic modalities applied in sports. Yes, what is the question? The question, ma'am, is what can you advise to the athletes to prevent injuries since they don't have regular or um, usual trainings nowadays before they return to competition if ever their event was resumed? Again, ma'am, what can you advise to the athletes to prevent injuries since they don't have regular or usual trainings nowadays because of the pandemic, ma'am, before they return to a competition, if ever they, their event was resumed? Ma'am? Come again, the event is who should? Are you particularly blaming an event or it's a general prevention procedure you're talking about? Is it the general prevention? Uh, Mark Anthony, um, are you talking about general prevention? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. I'll get to that uh, question. Okay. Because now due, due to the pandemic. How to prevent injuries, ma'am. Yes. Because now yes, most of them are at home. So what precaution you have to take? You have to take proper care of your hydration, nutrition, daily stretching. Exercise is very much required. Whatever game you play, proper stretching should be done. Because if proper stretching is not done, when they are going to play, there are chances of injury. And at the same time, they maintain proper conditioning of their body, body structures. That is also very much important. And when they go to play again, they should be very gradual in their return to play. Like since they are at home for a long time, uh, and their fitness, uh, whatever they do at home, it is not at par with when they do their particular game or sports. Uh, so uh, due to that uh, lack of fitness, when they go back to their return to when they again uh, participate in their game, it will be very gradual in their um, uh, approach uh, in, in terms of uh, timing, in terms of strength training, in terms of uh, conditioning, and in terms of the power of the game so that way they should they, that's the way they can prevent injury by going with it right well 
at the same time practicing proper stretching technique conditioning hydration nutrition proper whatever the practice they need to perform they should get proper recovery i think these are the methods by which um, a player can avoid injury after going back to play uh, after the pandemic um thank you so much ma'am thank you so much ma'am for that and um i hope our participant who asked the, that question satisfied for your answer ma'am thank you so much again ma'am so miss nita kavoluri about the different therapeutic modalities applied in sports and um we also have question uh yes questions to dr hamze hamze sir Are you is Dr. Hamze still here? No. Sir? Are you still here, Dr. Hamze? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Um yes, the question is for for you sir the question is is there a possibility to create a modified TDCs device or equipment? Sir? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Doctor Hamza, thank you so much for that uh, answer, sir. And um, to all of us, let us always remember that the primary aim of rehabilitation is to return to sports at a pre-injury physical and emotional level, and to prevent re-injury. And and uh, let's always uh, let's always encourage our athletes to participates in, in sports, reminding this is sports injury rehabilitation. Thank you so much. And let's proceed, um, Sir Johansson. Sir. Thank you so much, Sir Mark, being our facilitator in the open forum. Thank you so much to our distinguished speakers. Thank you to all our speakers. So moving on, let's move on to the concluding speech. Let's all welcome the chairperson of the Bachelor BPE program of Batangas State University, JPLPC Malvar Campus. Let's all work. welcome Dr. TJ Pangadiban, the program chairperson, for his concluding address. Sir? Thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. You're audible. Thank you. Go ahead, so, sir. Good day to our respected guests and participants. It's an honor for me to have the opportunity to give a concluding address in this well-timed and productive webinar. So in this international conference on sports injury rehabilitation with the team effective, safe, and therapeutic treatment approaches in achieving op optimal performance of athletes, I know that our participants had enjoy these technical sessions, not only because we have great resource speakers, but because of the topic itself, which would give us ideas on the importance of sports injury rehabilitation for our athletes. These sessions are very helpful to our coaches, trainers, and sports administrators because we can now adapt and apply the effective and safe treatment to our athletes who will be having injuries. We also gain knowledge on how to prevent sports injuries. Also, I observe our speakers' excellent presentations and active discussions, so I can conclude that the purpose of this technical sessions or webinar has been completely accomplished. I would like to pay my deep respect to all the participants for your positive participation in this event. I hope that what you have learned through these technical sessions will help you a lot 
in your duties and responsibilities as promoter of health and wellness and as a sports enthusiast. So on behalf of the IAPS, I would like to express my appreciation to our resource speakers, Ms. Shireen Rai, Dr. Hamse Bahar Louis, Dr. Bharat Kumar, Ms. Nita Kabuluri, and Dr. Kiran Kulkarni. Thank you so much for the great inputs. And to all our participants for taking out of your busy for taking time out of your busy duties and to attend this webinar. And also I must not forget to thank the organizing teams of the IAPES, Physical Education Foundation of India, and Sri Balai, Balaji Medical College and Hospital for working hard to make this collaboration successful. And of course, um, thank you, Dr. G. Wilson Santos, for the effort, for your leadership, and for the opportunities. Lastly, thank you to our Almighty God for continuously guiding us in the conduct of webinars. Once again, thank you everyone for making this a great success. Hope to see you again in our future events. God bless us. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. TJ Panganiban, for your concluding speech. And now, to give us his vote of thanks, let's call on the member of the International Advisory Board, International Association of Physical Education and Sports, Professor Faisal Fayaz. Sir, good day. Professor Faisal, Faisal, yes, sir. Okay. Greetings to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank you to all of you to invite me here. And uh, I especially congratulate to my dearest friend, Professor Jolson. He organized a wonderful webinar. And in this, basically, each and everyone basically expressed his knowledge and research work. To, the, to serve the community. It's not a basically common thing that we all basically set a platform and we organize different peoples and we deliver knowledge. And this is only this thing that we are, IAPES is just serving the humanity and especially it's giving the way to how optimally use your body and mind as well. So for optimal growth, optimal usage of human body and mind, it's very necessary to come to know and how we can basically manage each and everything and how we can improve ourselves as well. So injury rehabilitation is a very important topic. And I congratulate to Dr. Professor Dulson and Dr. Kishore as well, that he basically put focus on this specific topic to spread the awareness about this topic. And basically, it is the basically the least indeed topic which cannot be neglected due to the importance and competition of this era as well. So I especially thanks to all the speakers. First of all, Professor Julson, Dr. Kishore, Dr. MWS Johnson, Dr. Darwin, Professor Dr. Atindra Nade, Professor A.M. Murthy, uh, Ms. Shiri Dai, Dr. Hamza, Dr. Bharat Kumar, Ms. Neeta uh, Kavulauri, Dr. Kiran Kulkani, Kulkarni, and uh, Mr. Mark Anthony and Dr. TJ as well. So when there is a will, there is a way. So human always try to find a way for his problems. So movement, physical education is the name of life. That how we can optimally grow of our body and mind as well. And it gives us basically to improve the, our muscles and our internal stamina, internal capacity, internal strengths as well. So it cannot be neglected. And injury rehabilitation, it's a very important thing on which basically this session and this conference was organized specifically. And all the researchers and speakers very beautifully, very scientifically expressed their research work, expressed their basically knowledge and share in such a way that they are giving the hope to the 
community as well, specifically sports community. It's not a simple thing and we cannot neglect the importance of this injury rehabilitation. Reason, whenever we move, we face some problem as well. We maintain our different motor vehicles as well. So there is a need of our internal body maintenance and recovery as well. So thank you very much. And I'm really grateful to all of you. I attended the whole session and I, I learned a lot. All the speakers presented in a very good way and in a very professional way. So I'm very grateful to all of you. Thank you very much from my side. And thank you very much, International Association of Physical Education and Sports, who is spreading continuously this awareness, the importance of physical education, and giving the hope to all the humans to improve their internal, basically stamina, to optimize their growth as well, of body and mind as well. Reason body and mind coordination is very important. And it's only in the hand of humans. And it, we can only do this thing through yeah. physical education. Thank, Thank you very much from my side. Thank you so much.